All right, um, how are we doing? Good? Okay. Um, before I answer any more questions, I think I'd like to explain the rest of the law first. How does that sound? And then we can answer a lot more questions uh, about the law itself. With the law of cause and effect, there's a basic underlying principle, and that is that if you do not, in some manner, deal with the cause, then the effect will always occur, and on top of that, the effect will never change. So it will always occur and it can never change. So what, what I find a lot of people trying to do with their life is they try to deal with the effects of what's going on in their life all the time. All right? And the problem with dealing with the effects is that you're just going to exacerbate the future effects. You're going to make everything in your life even more difficult than it is currently. And unfortunately for most of us, what we do is we'd prefer to do that for some reason. And I still haven't worked out why the human race <laughs> would prefer to do that. Sometimes it's because, you can see it's because there's this desire for immediate remedy. Immediate. Remedy. Remedy. Uh, of an effect. And... Uh, the problem is that that's not even logical because you're not actually remedying anything. What you're actually doing is creating the potential for even more severe events to occur in the future because of the denial of the previous cause that was triggered by the law of attraction. So, so what you finish up doing is that when you try to cure the effect, whatever the effect is, and when I say cure, I'm not just using it in the, in, as a health term, but rather as a solution to an effect of something that's, that's painful or negative. When you try to cure an effect, the problem is, is that you don't actually deal with anything, really. Uh, you don't actually fix anything. And... In, in not fixing anything, there's this additional effect, and that is you've now denied the law of attraction event that just occurred to cause you to try to get into a some kind of causal co uh, situation. And as a result of that, there's a higher likelihood now of future events occurring that are more severe. And it, that can only be more severe because you denied the past event, which is an additional part of the cause. It's like, so what we finish up doing is here's a cause. So you could draw the cause as that big. That cause causes an event to occur, which has its effect on us emotionally. And let's say it's a pain-based effect at this point, right? Because these are the ones we avoid, the pain ones. So the law of attraction operates between the cause and effect. So the event is actually all about the law of attraction. And we have the pain-based effect. And then what we try to do is we try to rub out the effect. <laughs> you know, nobody saw that. <laughs> it never happened. So what's going to happen? We, 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 the event still happened, but of course another event has got to happen. But what we don't realise when we rubbed out this event, effect, I should put this pain base effect here, is the pain from the effect adds another layer around of denial around the cause. So now the cause is larger. So what does a larger cause do? It creates a bigger event, which creates a more painful effect. And then what do we do with that? We try to rub all that out, make sure that didn't make out that didn't happen. And so what happens? 
that adds to the cause and creates a larger cause which creates a, you get the idea? Larger event, adds to the event, which then adds to the pain, full effect. Now why has God created it that way? There's a really simple answer. Liam, if we have the microphone over there, whoever's looking after the mics for us. So you, so you eventually see it. Exactly. So you eventually go, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> maybe I need to choose to do something else. Maybe I need to change my action. Maybe I need to stop trying to fix the effect. That's why it's done. But, you know, unfortunately with the human race, we're quite desensitive and insensitive to effects, aren't we, even? Yep. So this is what often happens. I'll just get another pen because I've run out of colours. What, what colour do I need now? I really need a blue. So just, I've got a blue in here. So what has a tendency to happen now is that this gads back to the original. We get a bigger cause, which creates a big event, which is often cataclysmic in the sense that it terminates our physical life. All right? Or cataclysmic in the sense that uh, it causes us to deny our life to such an extreme that we don't even remember our life. So this is why there's a higher and higher incidence now of things like Alzheimer's and things like that. It's because we just, as a human race, we've got a stronger and stronger and stronger tendency to try to avoid the painful effect. And the more we try to avoid the painful effect, the worse the condition becomes until we can't even remember what actually happened anymore. We don't even want to remember anymore what happened. And that's pretty sad, really, because at some point in the future, we're going to have to. So now we're going to have to go through the layers that have been added to each cause before we get down to the original cause that actually caused the original event. We have just made our life much, much more difficult. You see, this is something we don't generally understand. Every time we do not, we ad attempt to address the effect rather than the cause, we are making our life much more difficult. We think we're making it easier, but we're actually making it more difficult. So, you know, let's, let's put in an actual situation that might occur, shall we? Let's say we have a causal emotion. And the causal emotion that we need to address is that we have very little love of self and we have a huge amount of grief associated with that. So in other words, we have grief about uh, love of self. Uh, a lot of you can't see that, but I'm writing in there, love of self. We don't love ourselves, in other words. And the reason why we don't is because we were taught to love our parents instead of ourselves. So whenever there was a situation where our parents needed love and, and we had to abdicate any love of self in order to love them, we did that. We automatically did that. We automatically chose to not love ourselves. Now, because we don't love ourselves and we're yet to grieve it, it creates an event. The event's purpose is to trigger the emotion, right? that we don't love ourselves and the, the grief associated with not loving ourselves. Does that make sense? 
But instead, what we do is the event. So the event causes us some pain that would demonstrate to us normally, under normal circumstances, if we were quite clear and we could just feel our stuff really easily, we'd realise the pain is about... I don't love myself and I can feel that I don't love myself and I just grieve, I just have a good cry about how much I don't love myself. Pain, I don't love myself. Uh, I'll just put painful, painful effect in there. Now, Let's say whatever this painful effect is, um, it'll often be related to my body in some way. Because when we don't love ourselves, we have a tendency to injure our body or hurt our body in a lot of ways. So, so let's say, for example, it could be a matter of uh, uh, one that comes to mind is just a lack of love of self usually causes fairly severe teeth problems, for example. Right? And so... And so we could have to go, the painful effect is we have to go to the dentist. How many of you like going to the dentist? You like going to the dentist? Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> there was only a couple of people's hand up, I noticed, though. So. <laughs> So go to the dentist because we've now got a rotting tooth on one of the sides and, and whatever side it's in relates to, you know, the grief of love of self related to the side. So it might be from a male, from a female and it will affect the size of our teeth and so forth. And usually with the dentist there's a lot of fear associated, isn't there, with the dentist? How many of you feel afraid of going to dentists? Yep, yep. So fear is a major emotion. So can you see how the fear actually relates to a fear of feeling the emotion of I don't love myself, af afraid to feel that. So let's just take that link out. So we go to the dentist and what does he do? He does a big root canal on the tooth or whatever it is that's affected. It, uh, you know, we feel that the whole thing's solved now. Now, the whole thing isn't solved, is it? And it's a pretty small event, our teeth, isn't, aren't they, really? Like, you can, you know, live without one of them. Not always comfortably, but you can live without one. But unfortunately, because we've now dealt with the effect, and I'm not saying don't deal with the effect, by the way, I'm not saying don't go to the dentist. <laughs> don't, you know, I'm not saying don't go and get your tooth fixed. What I'm saying is don't assume it's all over. Because it ain't all over. That's what I'm saying. So, you go to the dentist, you get your painful effect fixed, and you feel it's all over for how long? He says, oh, I'll come back in six months, 12 months, or whatever. We have a regular checkup, so you do all of that. And you then think the situation is resolved, and you go every 12 months, and you might have a few patch ups to do here and there, and the teeth get a bit worse, and you might have another one to come, and so there's another one gone. And, you know, you might have a cap put on that one and then, then eventually a couple of them might be taken out. So you need a little bit of a plate made up and you put all that in and everything's fine again for a lot longer. And now there's a plate, of course. The chances of the plate going rotten are pretty remote. And so you might not have to visit the dentist for 10 years now. Like, or if you do, it's only for a checkup, everything's fine. But the cause is still present. The cause of the problem is still present. And by the way, because we've denied the painful effect and only dealt with the effect, the cause of the problem has layers now of fear associated with it. The reality is, the majority of you would prefer to go to a dentist than actually cry about the lack of love of self. Isn't that interesting? We put up, ask people to put up their hands. How many of you like going to the dentist? Two people put up their hand or so. None of us like going to the dentist very much at all. And yet, I'm saying to you, you would prefer to go to the dentist 
than you would to feel the grief of a lack of love of self. That's how strong we have the denial of that emotion. We'd prefer to have a very painful and often what we consider to be a traumatic event occur than we would actually deal with the underlying emotion that caused it. It's pretty intense, isn't it, when you think about it? That's how strongly we want to deny. So we finish up having a greater cause that creates bigger events now, where we have a bigger, bigger lack of love of ourselves, and we now have these layers of fear associated. So there's just these fear associated now with this cause, where we do not any longer believe that we're even capable of even feeling the emotion and releasing it anymore. That that's the problem with the layers. The layers add to this belief that we are unable to actually release the emotion. And because we now believe with all of our heart that we're unable to deal with the emotion, large, which is not a truth, of course, but it's something that we actually believe, larger events get caused now that instead of involving our tooth, they start involving our life. And you know what? We would most of the time prefer that than still feeling the grief of a lack of love of self. We prefer to have a life-threatening accident than actually deal with the lack of love of self in most cases. Alan, you want to ask? Um, I'm just wondering if the layers of the, the cause continuing by the, the effect base uh, denial of the emotion, yep. is that like blockages in our fear when we're trying to get to the grief? Yes. What actually happens is every time we take an action to cure an effect, we are actually adding to a blocking belief around our cause. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, totally. We're adding to a blocking belief around our cause. We're actually adding to the layers now that it's going to take us to get into our cause. Yeah, and I'd imagine that that creates a bigger facade. It does, yeah. certainly. It's related to the facade. Obviously, the more and more fear and blocks to the fear that are created, the more we become, to live, become, a, we become a person that we're not even really. At, at this stage, many of you don't know each other. And you know why the reason why that is? Because, because most of you don't know yourselves yet. <laughs> and you present a facade to each other. And when you present a fa facade to each other, how can somebody else know you? They can't. And so what we're, we're in this layers and layers of, of blocks now. All, and every time we respond to the effect... A pain, particularly a painful one, every time we respond to it, we're creating another layer of blockages in, around the cause as well at the same time. There's more resistance, in other words, yeah. to getting to the cause. And just on a big picture note, is the financial crash an, a big example of the denial of the cause and it just gets bigger <laughs> totally. until the event just hits and it's a complete... Breakdown. Yeah, if you look at it, at, uh, like this, is, if the financial crisis is a good illustration of what we do as a human race. So what we do is we make out that everything's fine. We do this all the time, don't we? And so we make out everything's fine, an event is caused. So one country goes into total financial ruin, like Ireland in the European Union, for example, goes into total financial ruin. And everybody says, oh, that's just Ireland. Right? So they another layer of denial around the cause. Which the cause is this, this, these huge problems that we have emotionally. All of us, even here, have with regard to money, finances, how the financial system works, why we want it working the way it's working, and all these other issues are what's creating a lot of these events. They're all unloving. The way the monetary system works is unloving, and, and we, we've got a lot of denial about it, right? And so one country goes into financial ruin. And so what do the other countries do? They bail them out. 
See, so what the government does first is they get the people in the country to bail it out. So what they do is they tax the people more and that raises enough finances generally to bail out the problem. But when the people can't be taxed anymore, they then ask for help from other countries. And you know how the other countries help them? By taxing their people more, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so all of us start to feel the pain of the bailouts of irresponsible handling of money and this idea, like what's caused a lot of it with a, in the European Union, is this idea that I should be able to have what I want now. The reality is most of us still believe that, that we should be able to have what I want right now. Whether it's loving or unloving, I want it and I should be able to get it right now. And some countries have that emotion to a much larger degree than others. Huh? But anyway, they, that causes the event further. And then we get a second one, like uh, you know, Portugal has financial problems. It goes into what you would call in a company issue, receivership basically. And, and, and then because everyone wants to prop up the system or prop up the country, they then feed more into it, more people are taxed, more people get hurt and so forth. But, but the underlying emotion of what I, I must have what I want right now doesn't get addressed. And it's still in most countries. Right? And so we have this cycle of cause, cycle of denial. Everybody says, no, no, it's not, not bad enough yet for us to do anything. You know, $11 trillion worth of United States debt isn't bad enough for the United States to deal with its debt. Because they just had a meeting a few weeks ago and they decided that they couldn't deal with the issue and they've put it, postponed it. So it's obviously not bad enough yet. <laughs> huh? And this is what we do, we postpone what's bad. Have you noticed we do that in your personal life? You know, you get a bit of a sore on your foot, instead of looking after it and loving it and caring for it, you know, and then trying to work out what its cause is, what do we do instead? Ah, oh, yeah, we'll be right put on the same boots that cause the same problem, put on the same boots. We'll wear them in, you know, like put it on. And before we know it, we've got a great big sore there that, uh, that there's a threat of going gangrenous if we uh, don't do something about it. And that's what we're like with life. And that's what the financial system is like, exactly the same. We're all just a mirror of this process. And we don't want to address the cause, so again, we... we somehow try to deal with the painful effects. So then another country, Greece, goes belly up. Right? And in Greece, the a big emotion in Greece, in fact I saw a quote recently which was really funny, they said that in most countries the people have to forgive the politicians for what the politicians have done. In Greece, the politicians need to forgive the people for what the people have done. And the reason why that is, is because in Greece, yeah, everybody does have that big emotion there of, I want what I want right now. And if I don't get it, I'm going to do my Grecian thing, which is usually, you know, have a lot to say about it, even though there might not be too much truth with what's going on. And so, so, so there's this further collapse. Now, there's a country, the one country in the European Union, Germany who is able to basically relinquish or, or help all of these other countries because their economy is doing better than all of the other, those other three that I just mentioned put together. But does that seem fair to you? To have a country that looked after things and have done the right thing by their people financially, they haven't taken the steps of, you know, we'll take what we want right now, thank you very much. And instead they've been what you would call fiscally um, responsible, right? And, uh, and yet they're now bowling out the countries that have been exactly the opposite to that. So of course they're a bit resistive. You can understand that, can't you? It's like, it's like you, you know, you've been saving and scrimping and you've care, taken care of your finances and everything and your next door neighbour, he's just gone on world trips and he's, he's gone on, you know, holidays here, holidays there, he doesn't work at all, he just expects everybody to give everything to him and then he goes financially into ruin and then he comes along to you and says, oh, I want your money now, thanks. 
And would you feel that happy about that? Definitely not. Most people would not, would they? And, and yet that's what the Germans are being asked of them right now. And of course, they're quite resistive to that idea and concept. Hence, the issue is not resolved. And while the issue is not resolved, what's happening? The whole world market now, the pain is, the whole world market now has got these painful effects happening. The whole world now has this slumps in their finances, all the share markets are going, you have drops of 5% a day in some cases over the last few weeks and then it rises by a couple, very volatile. And all of this is happening because of the uncertainty right, in the market, but the problem still doesn't get addressed. The problem being, we every, all of us still want what we want right now, thank you very much. Uh, still not addressed. Natalie, you want to ask? I'm just wondering um, about the effect of spirit attack. Spirit attack's an effect, but how... Um, I, I don't know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm under lots of spirit attack, and... The well, spirit attack is an effect, yeah. So then, what's the cause that drives that? Well, it's always our hook into spirits and why we allow them to attack. OK. Yeah, but if I can continue on the Sorry. analogy... So now we've got a worldwide event imminent. Right? Because we've got the major power of the economy comes from the USA and Europe. Western consumption. We add very little to it because we're such a small country. Our entire economy is less than the economy of California. In fact, it's far less than the economy of California. California's economy is far more than, I think it's about 165 other countries, separate economies, right? Just one state in the USA. Yeah. So now a worldwide event is imminent. And what do we still do? We still want what we want when we want it. Thank you very much. So when's it going to change? It's only going to change when the worldwide event happens economically and all of us feel the pain of it. And you know what we'll go through first? What do you go through first in any... With it. What's the grief process? You know the grief process. What is it? No, no, there's one before then. Ah, yes. Denial. We will all deny that we had anything to do with it. And then we, what's the next step? Anger. We will all get angry that somebody else was the cause. And then what's the next step? No, no. No, this is the, the steps of, of dealing with grief. Who, who knows the steps of dealing with grief? No, you're guessing. There's somebody... Karen, you know the effects of dealing with grief. So, sorry, go. Right into the mic. Denial, anger, bargaining. Bargaining. Yeah, very good. Then depression and then acceptance. But if you believe that. Depression and acceptance. <laughs> We've got a long way to go, have we not? Because where are we when it comes to the financial position? We're in denial. <laughs> All right? So we go through denial. No, it's not happening. Not happening, not happening. And then all of a sudden, our own bank account is not even accessible. I can't say it's not happened anymore. Right? Then I go into anger. How dare the bank do that to me? How come they collapse? What's wrong with them? You know, that's the stage where we're basically blaming everybody around us, right? 
And then what do we try to do? We try to bargain with the whole process. Well, maybe I can get some of the money back. Maybe I could do this or maybe I could do that. And we can try to arrange something so that something works out in the long run. And we try to you know, do all of this stuff. And then all of a sudden we realise we get to the point where that's all useless. And what do we, most of us feel when it's all useless? Yeah, we suppress everything. We suppress our anger, we suppress our fears, everything. And we just go into this place. What's the point of living? What's the point of doing anything? And then after we get through that, which is a process of having to feel our... If we, we have to feel our denial, we have to feel our anger, we have to feel our fear, and then we get into our grief. And we actually, during this stage, eventually get to the point where we accept the grief of the cause... And we process it. And we end up in acceptance. We accept that we were a part of the creation of this worldwide cataclysmic economic event. That's what we do. So we've got a long way to go on that one, haven't we? Yeah. So, so can you see, though, the... It, it, it not only affects our own personal life, but, but even worldwide events are created by this denial process of denial of the, or attempts to deal with the painful effects. Most of the time, we even try to deny the painful effect. You know, I've had talks, literally thousands of talks to different people, when I say to them, your parents actually hurt you. They say, no, they didn't. They were good. Yeah, that's why you just had that event happen that's related to your parents, because they were good. Now, they might have thought they were good, and you might think they're good too, but the reality is they cause some very painful emotions inside of you that start causing these effects. And we need to allow ourselves to face the truth of it. Can you see how truth and the issue of cause and effect is so closely related? Without truth, you will never want to see the cause. And you know how many of you are still afraid of hearing the truth? Do you know why you're so afraid? Because you don't want to know what the cause is. That's the only reason why you don't want to, know, don't want to hear the truth. The truth allows you to trace backwards from this effect to its cause and to actually deal with it, to actually address it. The truth allows that. It's the only thing that actually allows it. And yet when we're afraid of truth, we're basically saying, no, 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 don't tell me the truth. Don't tell me the truth. And when we do that, can you see what we're doing? We're not even relating the effect of what happened in our life to its cause. And we, it's like you, you're automatically creating in our own lives, we're automatically creating blindness. Now, most of us would get very stressed if we were placed in a dark room with no light, no light ever getting in, and then told to live there for a while. For two or three days, most of us would be beside ourselves with, with distress. Right? But that's what we're doing our whole life. It's no wonder we're distressed. Because our whole life, what we're trying to do is we feel all these effects that we're blindly hitting into every single day and yet when some, somebody comes along and says look I can tell you the truth about that event no 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 I don't want to hear that we have the feeling that we don't want to know and and we're not then relating the two the two things the effect of what happened with its cause and truth is the thing that does that so truth is essential to our life that's why truth sets you free, because it allows you to fully embrace the power of your soul. While you're dealing with an effect, you cannot fully embrace the power of your own soul. Because your own soul has just created the opposite thing. So, so you know, while you're trying to rub out the painful effect, your soul's busy creating more painful effects. Now, you imagine you're sitting in your own home, and you've got some children... 
and they just come through your kitchen, they get all the flour out of the kitchen, right, and all the honey out of your kitchen, and they spread all the honey over the living room floor and spread all the flour over the top of the honey in the living room floor, right, while you're sitting there. Now, many of you wouldn't even be able to watch it happening, is that not true? This disaster that's happening. Now, while that disaster is happening, you could start cleaning it up, couldn't you? you say, oh, yep, yeah, my kids are about to put honey over the floor. Okay, I'm going to need a mop and a bucket and honey. What else am I going to need with honey? Over the, my carpet. Very hot water, obviously. Steam. Oh, the steam cleaner. I'll go and hire a steam cleaner ready for this particular thing that's about to happen. Right? And so I, you, you can just imagine how you, know, this, you see this event unfolding. And instead of stopping the child from creating the event, what do you do? You say, oh, no, no. They're allowed to create the event. I'm going to watch as it's happening and I'll clean up after them. All right? Now... I don't know many parents that would ever do this, but it's just. But this is what we're doing in our own life. We're cre we're creating train wrecks in our own life, and then we're just mopping up afterwards as we go along, without addressing the reason why the train wreck's happening. Does that make sense? That's what we're doing. And does that make? It doesn't make any sense to do that anymore, does it? But we keep doing it. We keep doing it. So. We're going along mopping up after our own soul, which is appropriate because it's our own soul that created it. But we're mopping up after our own soul and also many times expecting other people to mop up after our own soul, don't we? We get angry when they don't. And so we're mopping up after our own soul. And all the time, you know, our whole life is like this, usually 70 or 80 years long, maybe 90 or 100 if you're lucky, right? And what you're doing the entire life is doing this. Mopping up as you go along. That's what you're doing. Now, it doesn't make much sense to me to keep doing that. Does it make much sense to you? And yet we, we do it all the time. So instead of doing that, wouldn't it be better to stop mopping up after the event? So we stop mopping up after the event. What we want to do instead, so instead of trying to rub out the event, what we want to do is the event caused a painful feeling or a painful thing to happen to us, pain effect. And what we need to do is feel it, feel it, feel it. Hey, everybody, hey, won't you feel that there's something? We need to feel it, right? If you feel it, you will get to the cause. And if you get to the cause, there's a much higher likelihood of this event never happening. Now, instead of mopping up after the event all the time, what you're doing is now you've jumped in front of the event the event cannot occur anymore. They'll be in the past because you've actually dealt with the reason why it's being caused. So in other words, you know, you've tied up the children and put them in the room <laughs> so they can't spread the honey and the flour over the floor anymore, right? Not that I'm suggesting you do that to your children. But that's what we need to do with ourselves. We need to stop ourselves creating the same things or even worse things over and over again without addressing why we do it. Can you see that? Yeah. And it's understanding too that effects can never change and they can only get worse if we don't deal with causes. We need to understand that, really get that at the soul level in our heart. We need to really understand it. So when somebody comes along and says, oh, I had a, had a big cut today, went to the doctor, got it stitched up, and they said, and take, I took some painkillers, and it's all fine now. 
I'd say to them, it's not all fine now, because you're yet to address the cause. It's not all fine now. Renee? If we deal with the cause, just say we cut ourselves and we deal with the cause, is there a time lag in the physical or once we completely heal the causal emotion, will that, and that cut will heal instantaneously? Yeah, it would heal instantaneously if we had dealt with the cause, actually, fully dealt with the cause. It would heal instantaneously. It will heal gradually if we slowly deal with the cause. Yep. But I, I've had things like, I think I've explained to you sometimes during my progression, i over the years, I've had like my thumb just split apart for no apparent reason and just bleed and, and like just crack fully apart. I notice that some, some of you have had this happen to you too, where you've had different fingers or hit the heel of your, your feet or whatever, just crack apart, start bleeding, no apparent reason. And I've had that, one, one, one of the cracks in my thumb stayed there for four months. I had a band-aid on my thumb <laughs> collecting the blood for four months. It took two days for me to deal with the emotion. One day later, it was completely healed. That's how rapidly things can change. And in fact, if things don't change rapidly, it means you're not getting there. It means it's, things aren't healing. If things aren't healing, it means that things are not being dealt with. Yeah. So instead of being punishing of ourselves, we go, oh, okay, I must be very resistive to dealing with those things. I need to address why I'm so resistive. I need to, need to maybe pray about my own resistance rather than getting angry with ourselves for being resistive or so forth. Yep. Barbara? AJ, throughout my adult life, and now when I think back on it, in my childhood life when I was a runner, I kept on spraining my right ankle all the time. Yep. But as I got a, as an adult, I started realising I was feeling hopeless when that happened. Yep. But, I, but I never felt it. Yeah. But I, I didn't feel it emotionally, but I thought, how silly of me, I feel stupid, I feel helpless, you know, I can't do anything... And as the years have gone along, that spraining has slowly got worse. So it would happen about every six to ten months. Yeah. Always at work. Yeah. And I realised that it was happening when I was usually getting angry at men. Yep. And most of the people you've worked with have been have men. Have been men, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And then three weeks ago at home, I had a man turn up who comes to do the watering system mm -hmm. and he's an angry man and he's an alcoholic. And mm -hmm. I always go out and talk to him and placate him usually, yeah, yeah. fear of the angry man. Yeah. This day I decided not to and I saw him through the kitchen window and I said, you're just an angry man and you're an alcoholic and I'm not going out to talk to you, so which you is judged, a huge judgment. Judged him and yep. condemned him. Yep. 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 So he left a few moments later and I went down to tend to my oh, garden. Which you would do because he's now being judged and you can feel that emotion. Yep. Yep. And as I was walking down to my garden, I fell over. And you sprained? Sprained my ankle and my knee and my leg. Yeah. And, and it was on your right hand right side. side. Yep. And so I was thinking, okay, well, this has happened. It's my law of attraction to cause and effect yeah. for me to look at. And I was in a lot of pain and I was, in actual fact, couldn't get out of bed for about five days. Yeah. So I was feeling hopeless and useless yeah. again. So you started feeling that this time yeah. a bit. Yeah. And, and I was and I was releasing it and I watched... Um, um, a movie, The Stoning of Soraya M, yep. twice every day for the five days. Right, yeah. Wowed and cried for five days. About men's treatment of... Yes, the injustice of injustice. it and how useless women were to all of that. Yeah. Um, and so all throughout my life, that, that sprained ankle was actually showing me that every time because that's how I felt. But I personally didn't feel it. That's right. Until now, but I haven't felt it completely. That's right. Because I'm still limping. Yeah. But and it hasn't healed instantly yet. It so, hasn't healed so, instantly. So yeah. often what we do is we deal with it more and more until it heals eventually. Yes. Yeah. So, yep. But under, under that, I'm just wondering, because it's um, women, uh, the causal was women are useless, women, um, is that, that a, a, a grief of self-love though? Or is it just purely that? 
Well, well um, underneath almost all of our emotions are terrible lack of self-love, um, obviously. Um, but, but with most emotions, we need to be more specific than that. So this is why specific emotions cause specific physical ailments, because there is a direct linkage between a certain part of our body and what's going on emotionally. So, so, in, so in this case, like your rage with men um, causes you to also lack direction. You, you are constantly either trying to rebel and prove yourself with men, or you're trying to get them to do what you want, right? You want doing, trying to do Correct. one or the other. And, and instead of actually love them, which is actually the final result, the final result of all this corrective cause and effect stuff is that God wants us to get to the point of love. And the point of love is that, yes, every single woman in this, pl in this place and every single woman on earth and every single woman in the spirit world will eventually have to learn that they need to love men. And every single man in this place and every single man in the spirit world will eventually have to learn that they have to love women. And I don't mean love them sexually, I mean love them as people, you know, to care about them and love them as people. Which doesn't mean pandering to them and it doesn't mean doing what they want and it doesn't mean any of those things. It means having a feeling inside of yourself of care, love and truth with the other person. Actually loving them. And every single one of us we'll get to that position some point in the future. You know how long it will take? That's my decision, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it's your decision of how much you are going to accept the truth, truth. about what is the actual cause. Yep. So, so many of us finish up raging against the opposite gender, for example. And while we're in this rage about the opposite gender, we're no, nowhere near getting to the cause of our emotion. And because we're nowhere near getting the cause of our emotion, we are going to keep creating the same effects. And on top of that, many of them will possibly get worse because of the additional levels of denial that we're placing around our soul as we do this. And, and eventually, some point, and for many people, it will be in the spirit world after many hundreds of years, which is the reality for most people. Um, they'll sit down and feel their pain. Rather than keeping on denying, keeping on trying to rub it out, keeping on trying to do something else. Yeah. It's our willingness to just surrender to the actual emotion that is going to help you the most. And, and most of us don't like surrender. Don't like surrender. So, so what we do instead, we like fighting. We like that. Fighting is good, surrender is bad. Because we have all this sort of pride, ego, stoic feelings inside of ourselves that have all been also created by other causal emotions that have been usually placed in us by our environment and instead of giving all of that up or having a choice to give it all up we decide we're going to live in them for as long as we possibly can so it's the same as doing this thing you know the cleaning up after our soul and we're deciding that we're not happy with it taking until we die we want to keep cleaning up after our soul even after we die and for many of us we won't stop cleaning up after our soul until way after we've passed, if we're not careful. Yeah? Many f people that you know who have passed, who have known the divine truth, are still cleaning up after their soul in the spirit world. They haven't actually stopped cleaning up after their soul. Right? And the reality is that it's even a little more difficult to stop cleaning up after your soul in the spirit world. Because the facade's not there anymore. You don't get any rewards so for, for doing anything. So you just be who you are. If, if who you are is that you desperately want men's approval, you will keep desperately going for men's approval, trying to avoid the painful effect of never having men's approval. And you'll do that for maybe 500 years in the spirit world. And do you think you're ever going to get beyond the first dimension in that place? Definitely not. All right until you're prepared 
to go through this process of actually feeling the cause rather than trying to rub out the effects. And the process of forgiving, really forgiving, which is our willingness to feel all of your own hurt, to feel all of it. And many of us are still fighting, 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 fighting against our own hurt, fighting against our own hurt, and getting outraged about the injustices that other people cause us and so forth. Outraged every time, outraged again, outraged again. It was terrible what AJ did to me. I'm never going to forgive him. And even if I'm the worst person in the world, you're going to have to forgive me if you really want to be happy at some point in the future. That's the way it is. Luling. And then... Um, as, um, I'm aware that I'm uh, um, wanting to continue my punishment of my father mm -hmm. and my mother mm -hmm. for what I believe was unjust to me. Yes. And I... Um, because I'm doing that, um, I had... Um, I just wanted to know, is that uh, by doing that, I'm creating, because I'm angry and the hate that comes up mm -hmm. is actually making what they did, what I'm doing to them worse than what they did to me? Well, potentially, you can definitely do worse things to another person than what they've done to you, certainly. So, for, for example, and there's some really good examples in the Robert James Lee's material. There's an example of one woman who was just jealous of another person um, and their, her, their relationship with the man. And she did some terrible things to that woman trying to prevent their relationship. And she purposely set out to destroy their lives when they got together. Now, now her perceived hurt was that the man should have been with her rather than with the woman he was. That was the perceived hurt. And the problem for many of us is we can perceive hurt even when there's none. That's the reality. We, we can actually feel hurt about events that there is actually no purposeful or, or, or any hurt whatsoever coming from. We can do that. Why would we do that? Well, because there's been past hurt, perhaps, or oftentimes the opposite emotion. We've had what we want all of our life, and now we don't get what we want, so we now feel hurt. It can be both. It can be that we've been hurt, or it could be that we've never been hurt, and we want everything our way. And for the first time in our life, we're not getting something our way, and so now we perceive there being a hurt of some kind. Now, either one of those places, if you do not allow yourself to feel the emotion that created it, you will definitely act out the rage as a result. And when you do that, you can potentially do even worse hurt to another than what they have done or you have perceived, you know, you have thought they've done to you. Yeah. Um, why I ask that is that um, though I... I'm trying, whatever. Um, in the wake state, um, I started to watch my sleep state mm -hmm. and um, I'm discovering I'm doing a lot of things that uh, are pretty awful Yeah. as a result of my denied emotion. Yeah. As a, uh, yeah, every time we take actions out of rage, we are taking them because we are denying our hurt. We don't want to feel our hurt. We want other people to feel our hurt. And we don't care who the other person is often even. We're not very selective. In other words, oftentimes the person we want to feel our hurt might be our husband when actually the person who created our hurt was our father. You know, so, so what we finish up doing is hurting our husband when he didn't deserve the hurt, but now he feels hurt. Now he wants to be angry as well back with us because he has been hurt by you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, but unfortunately, a lot of times our hurt has been done by somebody else, and a lot of times our hurt doesn't even exist. 
can I put to you that a lot of times we interpret something as hurtful that isn't hurtful at all. We just interpret it as hurtful because we're no longer getting our way, which we feel is a hurt. Now, to give you an example of that, I've seen many of you in the audience perceive a hurt from another person that wasn't there at all. And some examples. Somebody has told you the truth and you've gotten hurt by it. And you hate them for a while and you dislike and you, you just don't want to see them anymore and you feel really upset with them all the time. That's a perceived hurt that doesn't exist. Some of you treat your husbands or wives very badly. Still. Right? And it's because of the hurt from a previous relationship or from your family or from your parents that you're unwilling to face. And yet... And you think that your husband is out to get you, or you think your wife is out to hurt you. And the reality is that she doesn't even know what you're talking about half the time. And the, real, the, the reason is because it came from somewhere else. The hurt came from somewhere else. And the problem is, that when we do that, is that we then go into this state of justification of hurting other people. And we are adept at hurting other people because of justifying that rather than feeling our own pain. The biggest single thing you can do for yourself in both your awake and sleep states is to be willing to feel your own hurt. That's the biggest single thing you can do to help your states improve markedly, is to be willing to feel your own hurt, to be real about your own hurt. Yep. If, if we have a mic. Um, do you mean um, to feel uh, my own hurt in the wake state will affect my sleep state? Of or? course it will. And also being willing to feel your own hurt in your sleep state will help you in your awake state too. That's what I don't know how to do. Well, it's the same in both cases. It's exactly the same. Excuse me, I just need to... It's exactly the same process in both states. You just need to cry. Um, I'm just becoming aware of what I'm doing in my sleep state. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I feel I can't control what I do in my sleep state. You can't. So the, only, the only way to control anything is deal with the cause. And this is where a lot of people get very surprised when they go to sleep or when they pass. Because when they pass or go to sleep, the facade is less a lot of the times because you, you can see the condition of yourself and you give up all pretense of facade. Right? And it, as a result of that, the emotion is the only thing that drives you. So if the emotion is, I hate my dad, that will drive you. It will drive you and drive you and drive you until you exhaust that emotion. That's what will happen. So... Uh to get my sleep state so that I'm willing to feel the emotions, yep. I need to do with it in the wake state. And vice versa. You can deal with your emotions in any time, sleep or awake. You can deal with them at any time. You just need to make an internal choice to actually deal with the cause rather than always blaming somebody else or trying to deal with the effect. We need to make the choice to feel the cause. So this is the power of your soul. While you choose to damage other people, while you choose to deny your own emotion, while you choose to justify it, while you choose to feel the injustice, while you f choose to not forgive, and remember forgiving is not an, a an intellectual action, but rather feeling all the emotions associated with the hurt. While we choose to do, not do that, we are just going to perpetrate further acts of unkindness on other people, whether we're awake or we're asleep. And we need to give up this idea that we're capable of actually intellectually fixing that. Now, the reality is we are capable of intellectually fixing it to a degree. That's what the natural love path is all about. 
but I don't know about you, do you want to take 500 years doing this or not? Well, I, don't, I don't think that's a very wise choice when you could take a few years. Now for most of us, we're taking longer than a few years because we don't want to face the truth, we want to mop up our effects. We want to, we like that. We don't want to deal with the cause. Every single day, God has made this beautiful law of attraction and this beautiful law of cause and effect to work hand in glove with each other to expose to us the actual causal emotion of grief that we need to experience. God's like made this beautiful system to lead us to God. And yet what we're doing a lot of the times is we're going, no, 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 don't like that system. God, you've got no idea how to create a system. That's what we're saying to God. And we're saying that instead of this system, we want to have another system. It's called the law of Alan John Miller. <laughs> In my case. <laughs> In Karen's case, it's the law of Karen, and Joy's case, it's the law of Joy, and so forth. And that's the one that we want to be right. right? And because we want that to be right, we are in total denial of the real causes, therefore unable to fully embrace the power of our own soul. And that's why many of us are frustrated. Many of you are frustrated, yes? Yes when it comes to dealing with some of these emotions now, frustrated, really frustrated. Right? And you don't even know why you come along to these sessions anymore, frustrated. <laughs> right? And the reason why we get so frustrated is because we're in denial of the effect or we want to rub out the effect and not face the truth, that it has a cause. And so, and so what, what we do is we become more and more and more frustrated, right? And what we, in that place now, who can influence you? Absolutely anybody who wants to cause you to doubt something that's true. Absolutely anybody. A little person come along and say to you, why do you go along to that AJ fellow? And you go, yeah, why do I go along to him? Why do I even do that anymore? Is the feeling we have, right? I am sick of hearing about emotions. Right? <laughs> sick of it. And so, we go, and so, we, so what we do is we, we get into this state where just a tiny little spirit who's barely able to keep his own body alive can say to us, don't go anymore. We go, yeah, I'm not going anymore. <laughs> That's it. And then six months later we go, gee, I feel like going again. Like, because, because, because we come out of that state sometimes. But some don't, by the way. I've, I've, known, I've known some six years ago going to that state and I haven't seen them come out of it yet. Eventually they will have to. Right? Because everybody has to in order to become either a, a, a completely loving person in the sixth sphere of the spirit world or at one with God, which is the other option. Everybody's got to deal with all of that rage and all that anger and all that upset that they have, all of it. Everyone has to, sooner or later. God's made a perfect system. You can't not. <laughs> Get used to that. Right? And the problem is we go, no, 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 I don't want God's system. I don't want to have to do that today. That's not free will. So what do you want? The free will to be anarchists or the free will to join in with the laws that are all loving that God's created? Right? That's the free will you've actually been given, not the free will to be anarchists. That's what we want oftentimes, the free will to be anarchists. But the trouble with anarchy is it affects everybody else's free will. It harms other people. God created a more perfect system than that. That's what God's done. So, so what we finish up doing is, unfortunately, when we get into this place where we're able to justify any action, we become so internally enraged and frustrated and annoyed with what God has created. And instead of yelling and screaming at God who created it, like all I'm doing is telling you about it. It's pointless getting angry with me. You know, you get angry with me, I can't change it. 
If you want to change God's laws, you talk to God about that. Not me. All I'm doing is telling you them. That's all. But what we do is we have a tendency to focus on the person that's telling us, the messenger, rather than actually focusing on the person who created it. Don't we? We do that with a lot of things. We need, if we're angry with God about God's laws, then be angry with God about God's laws. Feel it. Feel it. Let yourself feel it. And you'll get back to what that was caused by if you let yourself feel it. Don't act upon it. Because if you act upon it, all you're going to do is cause more. That's all you're going to do. When, you say, when I say act upon it, don't get so enraged with God that you decide to blow up every church. And there's people that have done that. Literally. Become so enraged with God they've decided to blow up every church. Why do, you think, why do you think there is all this violence in the world? Because people are so enraged that they're willing to do anything to harm another person rather than feel their own pain. Right? If you trace everything back, if you're willing to feel the painful effect rather than act upon the painful effect, you will eventually get to the cause. Of its, of, of its creation. That's what will happen. Isn't there a point when you've felt the feelings of an, a painful event, but then isn't there a point where it's time to act? Because I've gotten into some confusion about, I have like... Um, if somebody does something and I can see it's either unloving or um, it's a mistake that I've made in the past and I try to want to fix them, so I speak up about it, but I'm usually, like I was coming from a place of fear, like, oh no, they're going to do it wrong, so I have to fix it. So I realized that that was a mistake, and then I went almost to the other extreme of going, okay, I'm just going to feel the, the painful feeling of how that feels to have someone say or do something like that. Yeah. And then now I'm at this place where, okay, I've been feeling this. It, it's been dealing with a lot of feelings of oppression and having been controlled and that just, uh. mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I've been feeling a lot of that. And now I'm getting this feeling like, okay, there's another part to it. I need to act and speak up. And yet I'm afraid to because before I used to act and speak up out of fear. Do you know well, what I'm asking? <laughs> yeah, I do know what you're asking. Let's break it into two things. Firstly, we'll deal with your fear later about acting. But, so we'll just put that aside. Let's look at this whole thing of cause and effect. If you feel the effect, it'll take you back to the actual cause of it. So yeah, let's, say, let's say the effect was that you had to go to the dentist and get a filling. And instead of this time, instead of taking the painkillers after you've gone to the dentist, you decide that you're going to feel the pain of it instead if, and see where it takes you, see, see what direction it takes you. And in the event you get back to feeling the fear of your mother and how much you feel that she didn't love you and therefore you don't love yourself. Let's say it gets back to that emotion. So you allow yourself to feel your mother's fear and how every time she was afraid you never felt loved and eventually you get down to this feeling that I'm not loved by a woman and it was on my left side that I had my feeling and it's all related. Now my mother due to the law of attraction gets on the phone brings me up and she starts treating me unlovingly again now, can you see that if I've actually felt the grief of my love of self in relationship to my mother and actually felt it a fair bit, I will actually treat my mother differently. I will automatically treat my mother differently, actually. So when my mother starts being derogatory to me, saying, yeah, you've always been pretty useless in your life and, you know, you've never really amounted to much and, and you're still doing the same thing, aren't you? Yeah, you're so stupid doing that. And she's really into you about, like she always has been in her life, but before you hardly even noticed it, maybe. Now you're noticing it, which is an indication that you've dealt with some of it, 
otherwise you wouldn't even notice it. So, so she's saying all those things. And now you say to mum, mum, you need to stop. Just stop. If you keep pulling me down like this, I am not going to stay on the phone. And every single time you phone me, if you do this, I am not actually going to finish up responding to you at all. That's what I'm going to do. But I'm so afraid of saying that. Now I'm suggesting to you, if you're afraid, you, fr you have fear, which is an effect, of saying that is because there is still more grief to feel regarding that particular issue. So, so what I'm suggesting to you is once you actually deal with a lot of the cause, not necessarily all of it, but a lot of it, you will actually get into this place where you automatically act. And it won't, you won't be afraid of doing it either. You'll do it because you know you have to and it's the right thing to do and that's it. Does that make sense? So you will no longer allow your fear to dominate the well, interaction. Where I'm at right now is I can still feel the fear a lot, but then I'm willing to say something, but I'm also afraid that when I'm saying something, while I'm still feeling the fear that I may not be coming from love, well, of course you aren't, because you're okay. in afraid. You're never going to be right. coming from love while you're afraid. That's fine. You can't expect yourself to come from love while you're afraid. Yeah, I think I do expect Remember I myself. said earlier, fear and love cannot coexist at the same time. So if you're afraid, of course you're not going to be loving. However, you can look at the causal emotional reason why you feel guilty with your mother. Does that make sense? You can look at that you can actually begin to examine the guilt feeling, which is another effect that has a relationship to a causal emotion inside of yourself. And all she's doing in that example is the law of attraction has brought you another event to demonstrate to you that you have another flavour or another part of this emotion that needs to be addressed. So many of you do know what the truth is in a certain situation. Is that not the case? But many of you also do not act upon that truth in the situation because you're afraid. That tells you there's more work to do on the issue. That's all. That's all it tells you. And once you release the actual cause inside of yourself as to why you respond to the guilt trips of your mother, for example, you will never again respond to the guilt trips of your mother and you won't have to try. It was just, you get on the phone all relaxed. That's my mum instead of going into, you know, most people when they get one of the, a person who's caused them a lot of grief in their life on the phone, they get into this rigid, stoic feeling, right, where they go, okay, that's my mother. I've just got to control myself the whole time that I'm on the phone. I've just got to be very, very careful with what I say. I'm going to be very, very loving with her. And, and of course, of course, you cannot be because you're afraid. But this is what we tell ourselves. Instead of doing that, what will happen once the emotion is completely out of you, you'll be there all nice and relaxed and on the phone with mum. Oh, mum, how are you? Good to see you. Good to hear from you again. And then mum starts bitching at you. And go, mum, you're bitching at me again. What did I tell you about bitching at me? What did I tell you? And she says, I'm not bitching at you. Yes, you are. You're bitching at me. Why did I tell you? And she says... You're just a, you know, you know she's still, you tell, you're just a bad boy now. No, Mum, no, I'm sorry, you're just bitching at me again. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? She goes all silent on the phone. What did I tell you? I told you that I am not going to have conversations with you anymore where you're bitching at me. Didn't I tell you that? And you'd be quite happy inside of yourself doing all of this. You'd be all relaxed. Didn't I tell you that? And eventually she'll go... Yeah. So you know what I'm going to do now, Mum? No. I'm hanging up the phone on you. Uh, and what I did with my mum is I just said, ring back in a month and see if you've changed. And, and now my mum treats me with some respect. Uh, 
because 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 she knows she can't get away with unloving treatment anymore, and not she doesn't know because of how I treated her or how what I've told her. She knows because her soul, her soul, can feel my soul, and she can feel that this hole that I had here, which said treat me badly if you're a woman, is now getting patched up, right? Now it's only a tiny little dribble, right? And eventually, it's not going to be there at all, like that. And when it's like that, there's not going to be a single woman who actually believes that she can get away with anything with me. Does that make sense? In that place. They won't even, many of them won't even try, because they know they're not going to get it. Because soul to soul, you can feel the whole inside of somebody's soul, which is actually unhealed. The reality is you can feel that. And as soon as the other person doesn't feel that from you anymore, they will not do it. They can't. So my mother gets on the phone now, and you know what our last conversation was? She says, you know this law of attraction thing you've been talking about? What about this and what about that and what about this? And, and then we started talking about the uh, media and that. Yeah, they're all full of crap, aren't they? She was saying how, you know, they tell lies all the time. And one of my friends come up to me, because one of her friends that knows me for, since I was born, um, came up and told me, yeah, like Johnny, they call me Johnny. It's not like that at all is he you know why is he saying he's Jesus and she asked me about that and I didn't know what to tell her can you you know and so we have a conversation which is actually a respectful conversation not because of anything that I've done or said but because of the emotion being less within me that allows the treatment that it used to allow before yep so of course you will act differently because acting differently will be automatic. That's what I'm getting at. Once you release a causal emotion inside of you, it's impossible for you to keep doing the same thing you used to do. So many of you, many of you would even feel terrible about saying, I'm going to hang up on you, mum, to your mums, wouldn't you? Many of you would feel terrible about it. And yet many of you need to hang up on your mums quite regularly for a while until she stops treating you badly. And the reason why you don't is because there's an emotion of guilt that is yet to be released. That she placed there, probably, that you've yet to release and you don't want to know about. And yet every time you get on the phone, you get off the phone and go, gee, it just made me so angry. I'm so upset with my mum. I just wish she'd never ring at all. And, and so you know what you do then? You don't even ring her anymore. And she rings you up two weeks later. You don't ring me anymore. No. Okay. And off she goes again. <clears throat> and you don't tell her because you feel guilty. Because you don't want to address the cause of the guilt. You don't want to address why you allow somebody to treat you badly. And you don't want to feel that even they treat you badly. And many times we get angry they treat us badly. But we still don't want to feel the grief associated with somebody treating us badly. And when we're prepared to feel the grief, when we feel to feel the cause, now all of the effects disappear. Trust me, your life becomes really simple, hey? Simple as. You go through life going, wow, this is awesome. Like, I know that I can change anything that's negative in my life. Anything. Anything that is negative... In my life, I can change as long as I'm willing to feel the cause. What kind of power does that give you? Like that's, that's power to change your entire life properly. Not, not by any intellectual action, but actually to actually physically change your life through your soul's condition. Karen? I thought the, emo the emotion of guilt was a self-deception emotion. Is, that, is there a difference between living in it and feeling it or something? Well, what I'm saying is that guilt is the effect. I'm not saying guilt is the causal emotion. So the effect is, with my parent, with my mum, I feel a feeling of guilt. I can't hang up the phone on her, no matter how she treats me. She tells me, I'm your mother. <laughs> 
I'm allowed to treat you however I want, right? I brought you into the world. And, and as a result of that, hearing that all my life and feeling that all my life from her, I just, as soon as, as, soon as I feel uh, my mum on the phone, I go into this fear place. I can't do anything wrong, I can't do anything bad, I can't hang up on her. She's ter- treating me terribly, but I can't even tell her that. And, and guilt is driving me, and guilt is fear in the end. It's an effect. And there's a cause in there. The cause is this terrible grief I feel about myself in relation to my mother. I just feel like I'm no good, I'm never wanted, I don't, I'm not loved. All of these feelings come up. And instead of letting myself feel all those feelings, uh, I have a layer of fear over the top of them that cause me to feel guilt every time she calls. I actually feel rage with her, but I don't want to feel rage because that's bad too. You know, so these are the causal emotions. The even childhood rage. Many of you have childhood anger with your mothers because you know by the time you were just born, <laughs> what do most mothers do? You're hungry. The mother goes, "No, every three hours you have to be hungry." How many of you have done that with your own children? Every three hours you have to be hungry. And any time before that, you're just going to be let cry. That's it. Because I've got to get control of you. I've got to... You, you can't dictate to me my life. Right? I've got to get control of you. Of course, mum's feeling a lot of uncontrolled things to actually do that. So, of course, you're going to cry more and she's going to feel more uncontrolled. But that, that's immaterial to mum because she's not interested in dealing with her cause. So what she does is she tries to control you. So what she does is she feeds you on the dot every three hours or every four hours or whatever it is that she's decided is the regime. And the rest of the time you feel unloved, unwanted, uncared for, and you cry about it, it makes no difference. Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. And so, and so you've learned that whatever mum says is what happens. You've learned that. And so by the time you get to be 30, you still learn, you still feel that. 50, you still feel that. Mum's on a deathbed and you still feel that. And then she passes into the spirit world, like Michael's mother has, and you still feel that. Isn't that the case, Michael? Yeah, exactly. You still feel the same thing going on because, because until you feel the cause of emotion inside of yourself, nothing can change. Nothing can change. And that is the problem that we face with all of our life is that, is that all of these emotions that we have have their causes and nothing can change until we understand and fully conceive in our own hearts and minds that until I address the cause, there is nothing effective that I can do. Nothing. But if I address the cause... I have complete control now in reality. But some of the emotions feel like they're out of control. And so we don't want to feel that. Some of them feel like we're going to lose our mind. And we don't want to feel that. Some of them feel like we're crazy. We don't want to feel that. And so what we do is we want to heal, deal with the effects without healing the cause. And the law of cause and effect is such that it's telling us, sorry, Not possible. It's not possible to do this. What we're trying to do, not possible. We have to address a cause before something can change. And so what I do myself is I go, I look very, very carefully at the events that the law of attraction has brought brought to me. And I go, okay, this is very interesting. Remember I told you some time ago, I think it was probably three or four years ago, I told you the story where I set up an event which was a workshop and there were eventually about a hundred people booked into a series of five workshops and some of you might have come to some of those workshops about four four years ago or so maybe yeah four years ago probably and and so and what I what I mentioned to you and something that happened then was I had a, about a third men and two-thirds women in the workshops, each one of them. So all of, all of a sudden that tells me something, right? So I had a third men and two-thirds, two-thirds women. So far more women than men. And 
Every single woman was upset with my assignment of the date of her workshop. And I was providing the workshops for free. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You're providing a workshop for free and somebody's assigned the date and they're upset with you and angry with you for being at that date and they're getting the whole thing for free anyway. Now that's a lot of unjust emotions, isn't it? And I'm going, in one week I had, literally I had 48 emails from angry women in one week and I'm sitting there going, wow, I have got huge problems with women. Because my law of attraction is telling me that there must be a cause inside of me that would cause 48 women who are getting a free thing to be angry with me without even thinking, I'm getting a free thing. How can I even, how can I even be angry with a person when I, he's giving it for free? Does that make sense? And, and this is what I had to th consider. Say, now, my first response would have sitting there going, this is so unjust. I'm, f I'm feeling it's pretty unjust. What about you? Would you feel it's unjust? If you were giving something for free and you get 40 or 50 people angry with you for, for doing it, not at the time they wanted it. You'd feel it's pretty unjust, wouldn't you? Most of us just say, well, don't come bother coming along then. You know what I did? I changed the dates for them. I started changing the dates, changing the dates. And I get halfway through changing the dates. And I go, what the hell am I doing? Because <laughs> that's just changing the effect. So I stop. Okay. I've got all these angry women. What needs to be said back to them? If, I, if, if it was where I am right now, I would have written one message, I would have put them all in a group called Angry Women <laughs> and written one message. Dear Angry Woman, <laughs> you do not have to come. Love, AJ. <laughs> That's it. But back then, I was always pandering, even when I realised I was pandering, I still pandered, uh, even though it was a bit less, right? And so what I, what I did was write to every one of them, uh, talking to them about their anger. Well, why do that? They're angry. Now, some of them responded, but of course, many of them stayed angry the entire course that they came to, which was for free. <laughs> and of course they would. Because I didn't state the truth. If I stated, dear angry woman, you do not have to come. Love AJ. And that was it. And I upset 44 of the 48. And 44 of them didn't come. I would have been left with four potentially angry women who at least realised something. And that is they cannot demand something for free and then get angry about it. Does that make sense? And you see, well, a lot of times what we're trying to do is we're trying to make things better, but we actually make things worse for ourselves. I see this happening all the time. Just because we're afraid of the truth and we don't want to deal with the cause, we, we start addressing issues with, by the effect. And in, in, the problem, in the process, we make more trouble for ourselves. And this was something Mary was doing fr quite frequently about a year ago. She'd get an email from somebody let's say it was a person who was potentially rageful with her and there were quite a lot of men who were potentially rageful with her who would email her. And Mary would say all these nice things back. And then she'd send the email to me to have a look at. I said, why are you sending it to me to have a look at? Is it what you want to say? Yep, send it then. So she'd send it. Two days later, the guy would email back even more stuff, but even worse emotions coming from him. Huh? And she'd be saying, why do I always get people treating me worse when I treat them better? 
And I said, because you're not addressing the original issue of truth. He was sexually projecting at you in the origin, and now he's doing it more because you let him do it more because of what you said back to him, because you didn't want to deal with the emotion. You don't want to deal with the emotion, that's what happens. And so she says a bit more truth. Now he sends back a rageful letter. Right? Why do I attract all these angry men all the time? <laughs> you know? And it's the same thing, because right at the beginning, what you could have done is just address the emotion, and you could have skipped over three or four different emails, all that wasted time, and then eventually you would have got the anger back and you would have gone, wow, I'm really afraid of angry men, and into the emotion. Right? But because we pander and we twist, and what we do with this truth is we're not happy with God's truth. Very rarely are we happy with God's truth. Because we feel God's truth needs to be embellished. It needs to be made nicer, more palatable to the listener. That's what we feel. We believe this in, with our whole heart most of the time. So you know how you feel like uh, the truth that you feel even is that, um, yeah, mum's pretty nasty. You're just a nasty person, mum, to me most of the time. That's what you really feel. Mum gets on the phone, oh, hello, mum, how are you doing? big facade how you doing and mum goes into her stuff you know all of the guilt trip and whatever else and then she starts getting angry and nasty with you again like condescending or whatever no worries mum no worries you get off the road fucking bitch <laughs> how many times has that happened in your life honestly for many of you, it might not have happened with your mum, but it might have happened with your dad or a friend or an acquaintance or a guy who's selling Tel Telstra <laughs> you know, to you on the phone or whatever, right? And you, you, you do feel those kind of emotions, and yet, and yet we don't want to face the truth. You know, if I had said the truth right at the beginning, pick up the phone, mum, you treat me terribly, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. When you're ready to treat me nice, give me a call. That actually now avoided the next hour and a half of being attacked by her. And she has the option now of working out, why does she think I treat her badly for? Because let's face it, she obviously doesn't know, otherwise she'd stop. Right? And, and she would have the option of being able to determine that as to what's going on. And she might actually get on the phone and, you know how you said, I treat you badly? How do I treat you badly? Now she's given you an option to talk about it that you wouldn't have created if you hadn't spoken the truth before. Or she might get on the phone and say, you're a bitch, you know, you think I've treated you badly, you should see how other people get treated, you know, that's what, you know. And now you go, yeah, mum, what you've just done is exactly what I'm talking about. See you later. <laughs> right? It will become very clear as to who is your friend and who is not. And a lot of people who claim to be your friends are not your friends. And some of the people who, you know, your parents have told you are your enemies, they're not your enemies either. <laughs> right? Because once we start dealing with the truth and we understand the law, we can, st we can start dealing with things as they really are, rather than as we want them to be or imagine them to be. And when we do that, we have the power in our lives to change everything that happens in our life. Everything that goes on in our life can change. So what I would like to recommend to all of, all of you who are present, and all the people who are listening to this on the net or whatever, is that we start to look at where in our lives we are attempting to deal with effects rather than actually look at the cause. And even if you're still tempted to deal with the effect, at least acknowledge there is a cause, maybe a cause you don't even know, but there is at least a cause that created it. At least acknowledge it. But you could go a lot further if you allow yourself to get to feeling it. Do you understand? Renan, yes. thanks. Um, not the back, there it is. Hi, Jack. 
AJ, what what happens? What if your mother has never ever called you, and um, when you when you call when you have called her, she actually says that to you that you treat me badly, and then. For example, I might say, oh, what have I done? And then she'll go, blah, 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 and tell me everything that I've done. And I receive that and I feel into it and go, yup, this is like 15 years, 10 years ago. And I go, yup, no worries, that's, that's did, right. Did you do but, it? Yeah, I felt into do ways you, of where I've do you feel for, Do you feel repentant for doing it? Yes, I have felt that. I'd suggest not. Okay. Because yeah. if you truly feel repentant for doing it, the person doesn't keep repeating the same thing to you oh. generally. Oh, no, no, it doesn't happen anymore. Now it doesn't happen anymore. She doesn't call you at all now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> She's angry with you, yes? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, if we're the mother, in other words, if somebody else is calling us and saying, you know, you've treated us badly or whatever. No, no, no. Or I... we've called them and they say, you treat me badly. Then my first thing to do would be to look at whether that's truly the case whether there has been times when I have treated them badly, and then I would go to try to find the underlying causal emotional reason inside of myself why I did it. So if my boys rang up, and, and we've had my, I've had these discussions with like Tristan, for example, where you know, Tristan says, well, you know, at that particular time, Dad, you did treat me badly. And I go, yeah, certainly. Definitely treated you badly. Now, that's not good enough. I need to look at the reason why I did. Right? And a lot of the reasons why I treated my sons badly had everything to do with trying to get the approval of my wife, for example. And, uh, and so I had to work my way through how much I'm willing to sacrifice for a woman, including sacrifice my own son's welfare for a woman. And I had to go through and look at that emotionally. I had to look at what was my investment in that. So what I'm suggesting to you is to look at what's being said to you and see it as a law of attraction exposing something within you. However, your mum loves guilt trips, yes? Isn't what's, she? Uh, what's that? Your, your mum loves guilt trips. She's an expert at them, is yes, she not? Yeah, de definitely. This is one reason why you were rebellious when you were a teenager, yes? Definitely. Which is the reason why you caused her a lot of grief in your teenage life, is it not? Most definitely. Right. So what, what happened for yourself, and I, you know, I don't, haven't heard anything about your life, I'm just feeling what you're feeling. What, what happened for yourself is that, is that your mum oppressed you with this same kind of treatment for a lot of your childhood. You then in your teenage years went into rebellion and then purposefully caused her a lot of grief to punish her for her treatment of you. Is that not true? Yes. Yeah. And in some ways, you still attempt to punish women for their treatment of you even now. You still have that same pattern. So, so the key is to allow yourself to look at, firstly, yes, I have this emotion where I want to punish a woman for any perceived injury that I feel they have caused towards me, even if it's just a perceived injury, let alone an actual one. And that comes from the fact that your mum did cause actual injuries in your soul and you felt this huge desire to rebel and punish her for those particular injuries during your teenage years. And of course, on the receiving end of that, a person doesn't feel very good. So mum wouldn't have felt very good during those particular years of your life. I agree. However, mum's not owning the fact that she created it all. <laughs> Is she? No. 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 And, and as a result of that, um, there are emotions that you, I would then go into of why am I still attached to wanting my mother to love me, even though she has proven to me over and over and over and over again that she doesn't love me and that she feels that I have caused her harm. Right? And there's an emotional reason why you want that from her and you're not willing to give it up. You're not willing to grieve how she's treated you properly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So now that I say it, you can feel it a bit. Allow yourself to grieve how she's treated you. She has treated you very badly. This is why you rebelled when you were a teenager. She treated you like you were worth nothing, and you. She, she's narcissistic, 
and treated you like you were worth nothing, only for her pleasure and enjoyment. And as a result of that, you then went into rebellion. And the key is, you're still seeking this love that you feel is missing from her. So when you ring her, you're actually projecting at her, please love me, mum, this time. This time, love me. This time, love me. And of course, she doesn't love you, and she never has. Right? And so she just gets on the phone and says, you are, you know, I'm upset with you, you've caused me all this trouble, blah, blah, blah. and she proves again that she does not love you, and she proves again that she does not understand that the whole time you rebelled, it was all because of how she treated you, and she's proven again these things over, and let's face it, Renee, she's proven this over and over and over and over again to you, and you still do not want to grieve that your mother does not love you. When you actually cry and grieve that she doesn't love you, which is the cause of these events, you will actually no longer feel like you need her love anymore. Yeah? And once you get to that point, you won't feel like blaming or rebelling or any of the other things towards other women either. Does it make sense? Yes. And, and you will actually have a good sense of yourself rather than a rebellious sense of yourself, which you currently have. Yeah? But can you see that because when, when we stop trying, when, st when we don't want to deal with the cause, we go into all this effect stuff. And part of the effect stuff is trying to get something from another person. Like for, one of the things we're adept at doing is we badly want to be loved. Right? We badly want love. And it's amazing the lengths we'll go to, to compromise and compromising truth in order to get the feeling that we feel is love. But I suggest to you that every single time we compromise this, the truth, we, it is going to be impossible for us to be loved or feel loved. Thank you. Yep. So my suggestion there is again, just uh, again, avo you're avoiding the cause. The effect is mum attacking you. The cause is the events when you're a teenager. But the real cause of the events when you're a teenager are how your mum treated you when you were little. Yeah. And how you felt as a result of that treatment. Yeah. Chris, thanks. I like your shirt, Chris. Thanks. Um, I was wondering about the, you know how you mentioned the child being fed every three hours and feeling like um, they're crying and then they want to give up? How do you get through those giving up feelings to know your grief is actually going to help you? Um, the only way to get through any feeling is to feel it completely. So, and, and this is something I keep repeating over and over again, but many still do not understand what that means. Feeling something completely means that you have to actually feel the emotion that's present in that moment. So if the emotion is, I'm angry with God, be angry with God. Be angry with God. Direct all this anger and rage that you have and feel of God. If the emotion is, you're angry with me, then be angry with me. You don't have to come and do it to me because I'll just say, go away, Chris. You need to... You need to do it at home, you know, in your privacy of your own house or your own... Be angry with AJ if you feel you're angry with AJ and see where it takes you. But underneath a lot of this stuff is, is deeper emotions, of course. And the key is if you feel the emotion that's right there, the layer that's right there, and you have a willingness, sorry, have a willingness to get below that, you will go very rapidly below it. So, so I find if, I, if I'm ever angry with somebody, you know, 15 seconds and I'm into some grief generally about what that anger is about. Does that make sense? Yeah, I've got the problem where I go into the anger and then it just, this big kind of blanket of it's useless kind of comes over me. And I so just... feel it's useless. Just feel it's useless. And, and actually voice it. This is just useless. I don't know why I'm bothering, you know, I, I can't get anywhere. And feel that feeling. Just allow yourself to feel that feeling completely. Every feeling that you allow yourself to feel completely will release from you. 
and you'll know it's released because you don't feel it anymore afterwards. Now, now many of you have yet to have what I'd call the major emotional breakthrough, which is understanding the peace that comes after something's completely dealt with or, or dealt with significantly. Because when you deal with an emotion significantly, one of the causal emotions, there's this beautiful feeling of peace afterwards that stays with you often for many days. And, uh, and while you may have to revisit some of the emotions again because you haven't dealt with all of it, that feeling is present. If the feeling isn't present, then it's because there are blockages to feeling those particular emotions. So for, for many of us, there's blockages to grief that we don't, we don't want to feel through the blockage. So, so if one blockage to grief is fear, I'm going to have to feel the fear to actually feel it. So that means shaking and trembling and feeling terrible, you know, feel, actually feeling the fear. And, and once I start really feeling the fear, I'll actually probably be crying while I'm feeling the fear. It'll, be quite, it'll feel quite traumatic and shocking, feeling fear. But when you've gone through that, you'll easily get to the grief. We have to feel through every causal emotion. And a lot of our layers on top are emotions that are, were there from our childhood that we also have to address. Yeah. If we just focus on the effect, which is, I'm angry about how my mother treated me, then I'm not going to get very far. I need to feel my anger, but I need to be prepared and willing at the soul level to go deeper. And there's a change that happens in your soul when you're fully desirous of feeling every feeling. And what happens is that there's this willingness inside of you just to go there, no matter what there is. You know, if there is a feeling that you're crazy, you're willing to go there. If there is a feeling that everything's unjust and I hurt terribly because of the injustice, you're willing to go there. And one of the best emotions, one of the best things we can deal with is our unwillingness. If we can deal with our unwillingness, everything else gets a lot smoother. Yeah. And our unwillingness is usually a causal emotion because we are afraid of humiliation. We're afraid of being punished. We're afraid of being hurt more if we cry. You know, how many of you have remembered your mother or father saying to you, if you cry anymore, I will belt you again? How many of you remember that? that more than half. That, that is going to block quite a lot of grief, this fear of being punished again for just even crying. Now, God doesn't feel that way with us, but... but our parents often do. And it's those blockages that are causal blockages within us. When I say they're causal, they're actually layers over the top of some causal grief that are still within our soul that create f further events. And we need to allow ourselves just to feel them. Every time we feel them, they will release. If we don't feel them, they will not release. Mm. I know it sounds simple, but as you know, it's quite hard getting to the emotion that is, is able to be released at times. And I, I feel that too, you know, like difficulties of getting to certain emotions. Yeah. Thanks. Lizzie, mm. and then across here. Um, as a mother, coming from the other end, mm -hmm. um, our eldest, Lucy, she's always been uh, what we would term our, our wild child. And, and now since I've been doing this work, I'm owning as much as I can or willing to of everything that she is in her life. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that when she triggers me, um, I will really feel that instead of telling her off or saying, you know, that's really disrespectful or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really feeling there's changes uh, there have been changes in the last week or so with my doing that. Mm -hmm. And now I've gone to a real deep level of huge repentance for what I've done mm -hmm. to her. Can I sort of explain to people what's happened for yourself, just to, just to give some clarity to it? 
What happened uh, is you have a daughter, the eldest daughter, and what mum has done through the eldest daughter's first 10 years of her life is basically everything she wanted. Is that not true? Yes. Everything the daughter demanded was given to her. If daughter wanted to come and sleep in the bed with mum and dad, then she slept in the bed with mum and dad. If daughter wanted to get something to eat, then mum sorted out something to eat for her. If daughter wanted to go shopping, whatever, just giving some illustrations, mum did those things for her. And so in the end, the 10-year-old came to learn that I am God. To mum. That's what she learned. I, in other words, I am the boss of this family. I'm the one with total control. And, and what we've got to do as parents first, if we've created that kind of a child, is we have to first grieve or go through the process, like you say, of repentance for the creation of that. We did that. Now, it's an emotion within us that did that. It's an emotion of pandering to our children, trying to give them what we never had, and a lot of other similar types of emotions cause us to continually give and give and give and give, not looking at what we're creating. Because what we're creating is this, a monster. That's what we're creating. And what we need to do as parents, instead of trying to correct the monster, is we firstly need to correct the reason why we created the monster, which is all to do with what we define as being a good mum, define it, you know, like, so a good mum always does the best for her children, a good mum does this, a good mum always gives the child whatever she wants, a good mum, and a good mum, or never, and there's guilt driving that, and there's all sorts of emotions driving that, and what we need to do, if we get into repentance, we'll start to actually see the emotions that created this. Now, as we do that, actually, there will be an immediate effect on the child, which is what you're finding this week, the, an immediate effect yes. on the child. However, the child will also now, because the child is now how old? Fifteen. Fifteen. She will also have some of her own work to do. And, and there is a demand coming from her now that she is treated like she is the ruler of the household and so forth. And that is something that you will have to confront as the, as the effect of your own creation. Yes. Yep. yep. And as you do that, she'll go through a tantrum here and a tantrum there and a whatever here and a whatever there. And eventually she'll work through the grief of not getting her own way anymore. And she'll actually feel happier too, actually, as a result. Because she'll, she'll start having self-responsibility. She'll start treating other people with more love. She won't try to boss other people around all the time, treat her sister badly and so forth. And, uh, and that will happen automatically because she is now dealing with that emotion. She's now getting rid of the thought that she is the ruler and realising that actually for love to happen everyone needs to be have some equality so me, she needs to be equal it's also made me sort of kind of stronger that I can say no yes there was a huge injury in me that I couldn't <coughs> say no and that comes from my own mother who just gave us everything because she couldn't love us so she gave us everything physically yep and the typical mother you know feed you nurture you cook Clothe for you, you do everything for you that was love yeah so I was I, but I didn't know I was doing that of course exactly you do now though yes I do now and the ef the effect the pain of the effect so by the time your daughter was 10 you were feeling the painful effect of the creation and the key the key is to not go into blame of the child which a lot of parents do do so that's what Renee's mum's done she's gone into blame of the child which is actually not dealing with the cause for mum at all because she was the cause of of the rebellion even and instead deal with the underlying cause within yourself as to why you created the child in that manner, why you assisted her to develop in that manner. And when you do that, you'll find there's an immediate release in the child without the child having to do much until they get to a point where now the child has only a group of emotions which were the own, their own creations based on their choices rather than what the parent assisted them to do. And she will have those emotions to deal with. 
she will have emotions to deal with about her own choices that were unloving as a result of what was created. But by you repenting for what's gone on, you automatically assist the clearing of both yourself emotionally from, and the flow of God's love into you emotionally, but you also assist her to have some connection as well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. It's a very powerful effect, actually. Most people do not realise. Now, the law of cause and effect is one thing I'd like to just talk about just briefly while, while we've got another maybe... Uh, well, we've got another minus one minute at the end counting at this point. But um, what I would like to mention is that, is that there is a relationship between this law, the law of cause and effect, and every other law of divine love. And that is that with love, there is always something that's unloving, that's the cause of painful events. So whenever the effect is a painful effect, there is always an unloving cause. Does that make sense? So, so when we notice a painful effect, we know that the law of love has also been broken. All right? And in particular, the law of divine love is all, has been broken. And what it's helped me do is actually come to terms with and remember a lot of the laws of divine love that I'd forgotten for some time in my life. And it helped me remember a lot of them by realising that every single time there's an unloving effect, there was something unloving inside of me that was the cause. Now, if I can give you an example. I think I've mentioned a few times uh, how um, I had a relationship with a woman who I only saw once a month for one day. And, and that was over a period of like a couple of years. I only saw her once a month for one day. And every time she left, I just cried and cried and cried for a couple of days. Like, because I, I wanted to be with her more, but she didn't want to be with me. Interesting. But we'll keep that aside for a minute. So, so I wanted to be with her. She didn't want to be with me. And, and every time she left to go back to her home, which was 900 kilometres away from mine, and... Um, I would just cry and cry for quite a few days. And then after a while, uh, you know, after crying for quite a few days, one time, I went, wow, I'm in pain. <laughs> As if I didn't know that earlier. <laughs> and... And for the first time I realised that actually I'm in pain because I'm keeping on choosing exactly the same course of action. And then I thought about the course of action. I thought I was almost addicted to this idea that I would long for her and miss her terribly for the entire month and that was going to be the rest of my life. All right. And then I realised that actually if I loved her, I would not be in pain. Even if she only wanted to see me once a month. I wouldn't actually be in pain if I actually loved her. Because love can only cause loving effects. So if I had actually loved her, and, I, and I, if I knew what love was, of course, at the time, if I actually loved her, I would not have felt any pain with her leaving. The opposite to what I was thinking before. Because every time she left, I felt pain. Every time. Every time. She left. Pain, leaves again, pain, leaves again, pain. Then for the next few days up to the time she was coming, excitement, yeah, she's back again. And then pain. And often the day wasn't very good because obviously she didn't even really want to be with me anyway, right? So I'd feel the pain of that sometimes as well in the day. And then I realised that I'm feeling all this pain and I'm justifying it by saying that it's because I love her. And then it dawned on me. 
I mustn't love her. I must have something else going on other than love. Right? And when I looked at what else was going on, there was just a need to be treated badly by a woman, thinking that that was love. There was a, a need or a desire to be wanted by somebody who never was going to want me. Does that make sense? It was very, it was very, very um, what would you call it? Dysfunctional is probably the best way to call it. <laughs> and, and I realised that, and I, but I did come to terms with this one thing, and that is that if the effect is painful, then the cause isn't loving. Love is not the cause of pain. Love is never the cause of pain, in fact. So I can't say that I love the person and that's why I'm crying. When the person I love dies, I can't say that the reason why I'm crying because is because the person I love died. It's not the reason why I'm crying. There's a different reason. And it's got nothing to do with loving the person. And once you realise that a painful effect can only have an unloving cause, you will be far more self-aware of what's going on inside of yourself. You will want to be actually far more self-aware. And once I realised that link between the cause and effect and the unloving cause causing a painful effect and a loving cause causing a joyful effect, both it applies. Once I realised this relationship, I realised that I actually had the power within myself to change the amount of joy I have happening in my life. So even if God wasn't in my life, I would have the ability to become more happy and joyful just by understanding the relationship of the law. Does that make sense? Even if God was not in my life and I wasn't receiving God's love, I'd have the ability to progress and become, more, and become happier. And that's the beauty of the law, is that it demonstrates that. Every single day to us, it demonstrates this truth, that love always has positive, joyful consequences. And a lack of love or fear always has unhappy, painful consequences. So, how many of you feel unhappy that you do not have a relationship? You know, you, you feel that you don't have somebody in your life, your soulmate or whatever that you love. How many of you feel that? Okay. If you feel unhappy about it, it's because there's an unloving feeling coming from you towards your soulmate. Not the other way around. See, see, a lot of you are going the other way around. You're going, yeah, my soulmate hasn't worked this out yet, and my soulmate hasn't worked that out yet. And even if I know who my soulmate is, well, you know, that's because they don't want to do this and they don't want to do that. It's not true. It's not true. Because you won't feel this grief inside of you about not being with your soulmate if you had actually healed the causal emotion related to love that's involved. Because once you love your soulmate, you'll be okay, completely okay, with not being with them. And the irony is, there's a high likelihood in that place that they want to be with you. <laughs> because they're no longer feeling the projection, 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 fear-based and unloving-based projections coming from you that create the separation. And if at least one part of the soul has no unloving projections coming from them, the other part of the soul is bound to be attracted. Can't be helped but to be attracted. Does that make sense? So understanding the law can change your life in a lot of areas. How many of you feel dissatisfied with your financial position in your life? In other words, you can't create what you want to create because you don't have enough money. Yeah? So... What do you feel that's about? Well, that's because I, I didn't have an inheritance from my mother and father and because nobody will give me any money for some reason. And what is it about? 
What is it about really? It's about an unloving cause within yourself related to this aspect of finance or money inside of ourselves. And all we've got to do is find it. And the law of attraction is probably bringing it to us every day. Because remember, we have a cause that creates an event. Like clockwork, this happens. This is like clockwork. This is like tick, 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 another event, tick, tick, another event, tick, tick. It's like, honestly, within the course of an hour, we have event after event after event. And within the course of day, hundreds of events are showing us. And, and if we want to know them, we'll just feel, we'll eventually see the painful effect. Now, how many of you do feel the painful effect of not being able to create what you want to create? Well, you're liars. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Well, if you felt the painful effect, you would have found the cause. So you're not letting yourself feel the painful effect. You're trying to work your way around it all the time. Because if you really felt the painful effect, you would be in the cause and next day, two days later, five days later, everything will change. That's what would really happen if we were really feeling the painful effect. But you know what we do with the painful effect? We go, oh, I don't want to feel that, I don't want to feel that, I don't want to feel that, it feels terrible, I don't really want to feel that. And remember, the painful effect isn't often what we think. You see, see with the aspect of money, for example, we're often going, yeah, I don't have any money, I have a big cry, because I can't create what I want. Now, is that the causal emotion? Like, did the child at two years of age understand money? Five years of age, did they understand money? Probably not. Probably seven, they might start to understand money, maybe. Eight, nine, maybe ten, you're starting to really get money. Twelve, thirteen, now you probably understand money. Where do most of our causal emotion come from? By the time before we're age of seven, before we even understood money. So, so how can how can we cry about the lack of money and expect our money situation to change? It doesn't make any logical sense. If our causal emotion is before the age of seven, most for most of us, then whatever happened had to be related to what happened before we were seven years of age with regard to money. Isn't that logical? And if we're not getting to that emotion, we're not dealing with the cause. And if we don't deal with the cause, we're not going to change the event, which is that we don't have any money. Does that make sense? Or does it make dollars? <laughs> that was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> Can you see the relationship, though? You see, a lot of times what we're doing is we are actually crying about the effect you see see what we're doing is the event events happen you know we put a thousand dollars in our bank we have a car accident 1500 bucks out goes a thousand dollars and another 500 we're now in debt that's the event the painful cause now we're feeling stressed we're feeling anxious we're feeling part of this is a part of the cause the stress and anxiety that we feel about money or the lack of it that's part of the cause. But we don't feel that. You know what we do? We go out and get another job. And we earn some money and now we feel safe. Now we've just dealt with the effect. Even if we have a cry about the painful of not having the money, we're still feeling the effect. Because we're not feeling the cause. And we need to discover the cause. Your guides are just hanging out with you to help you discover the cause. You know, any mediums in the room, trust me, any person who comes along to you, their guides are going, tell them the cause, tell them the cause, tell them the cause. You know, not the effect, not to deal with the effects. The guides are focused on this. If they're on the divine love path, your guides, they are focused on this. So with money, we are obviously feeling the effect of a lack of money, but we're not allowing ourselves, we're trying to feel the effect. But we're not fully feeling it, because if we fully felt it and we really got into it, we would actually connect with the cause. And the cause won't be about money. Because it's highly unlikely it's about money, because most money issues get created before, or most emotional issues get created before we're seven years old, and we didn't understand money, most of us, by then. 
So it can't be about money. It's got to be about emotions from our parents. So how did our parents feel about money? <coughs> Liam? So um, what happens if uh, there's two children um, and with the money situation, um, one child carries on about how they don't have any and yet the other one who doesn't seem to have dealt with their emotions I suppose fights their way to actually creating creating their own money what a situation like so what I'm trying to say is it's just a, a pendulum of the same problem here's balance yeah one child responds this direction because of their personality Personality depends on how we it determines how we respond to a causal event. And one child says, I've got no money, I'm never going to have any money. The other child will go out and create lots of money. But they still have the injury. So we're then something, say, the one child who doesn't have money finally works out their cause mm -hmm. and becomes uh, not necessarily abundant, but doesn't have that problem. I suggest to you that if they're not abundant, they have not found the cause. What I was going to say was, <laughs> but so the effect would be, say, the, uh, the financial crisis again, that one with all the money loses it, but the one who is abundant doesn't, the, the crisis doesn't affect them at all. Well, a person who's abundant won't feel they have any lack at any point in time and therefore will be doing exactly what they desire at all points in time. And, uh, and, and I suggest to you that if they feel they don't have abundance or they still feel they're not necessarily abundant, they still haven't dealt with the underlying emotion. I've found from experience the emotions with money are quite severe and mostly to do with a lot of emotional trauma with the relationship between our parents. Um, you see, every single time our parents had an argument, we felt no love whatsoever. Every single time. Now, what are the causes of a lot of arguments in a relationship? Money's one. Any others? Sex. What else? Mother-in-laws. <laughs> so sex or unfaithfulness in sex and all those kind of things cause a lot of arguments. Money causes a lot of arguments. And there's a third major cause of a lot of arguments in a relationship. Injustice. Injustice is a third major cause. So in other words, one or both parents feel that the other parent is doing something unjust to them or unjust to the family. That's a major cause of arguments. Now, if you look at those three major causes of arguments, every time your parents argued about one of those things, all the children in the family felt unloved. All of them. Because every time there's anger in a person, they are not loving. Simple as that. So, so the, parent, the children could be upstairs asleep, right? And downstairs, the parents are having an argument the children can't even hear, and yet the children are still going to feel unloved from the event. Because they're in the sleep state, feeling the feelings from their parents anyway. So they're still going to feel the feeling. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so what's happening really is that every single time my parents argued, I am going to have an emotional attachment about the reason for their argument. So if they argued about money, or they felt afraid about money, or they felt they didn't have enough money, and every single time they felt afraid or angry, I will not feel loved. Every single time. So if mum's terrified about how little money she has, I am not going to feel loved in that moment. In that moment. So mum opens it, gets the mail, opens the bill, looks, oh, another bill. In that moment, she has fear. How am I going to pay for this? All those feelings start coming up for her. In that moment, every one of her children do not feel loved. In that moment. And so what do the children learn? Love is going to be removed whenever there is a 
money issue. That's what they learn. So they learn a link. There's a link created in them emotionally between the money itself, the having of it, or the have notting of it, and their being unloved or unwanted or uncared for. There's an automatic relationship. Now, the personality of the child will determine how they respond to that. Some of the children then go out and produce as much money as they possibly can for their mummy. They're producing it for their own life, but they don't realise they're actually producing it for their mummy. So their mummy doesn't have to be afraid. Does that make sense? And the alternative is they go into this place where I don't deserve anything, I don't want any money. Every time, every time anybody gives me money, there's always, there's always strings attached. To it. There's all sorts of emotions associated with our parents with money. And that's what causes the lack of funds in our life, the, the lack of prosperity in our life. It's nothing to do with the actual money. And you can find people who have lots of money and they still have the same emotional issue. <laughs> Yeah. So what does that tell you? It tells you that there is an underlying causal emotional fear about money still within them and they have either gone to produce it in order to prove that, you know, to give them the approval from the parents or whatever or they've gone to say they've got none and keep on, they keep on spending it without producing it and that causes all sorts of other attention issues with our parents. Either way, we s still need to find the cause. And so with money issues, the cause is very rarely related to money as a result. The cause is usually related to a lack of love coming from the parent. That means you, one of the best things you can do, to be honest, is to list all the things mum and dad get angry about and all the things mum and dad are afraid of. Because they are the times you never felt loved. And you'll start connecting emotionally to many of them if you allow yourself to do that. Let's give me another example. You know how we have like phobias, like claustrophobia, agoraphobia, what's a spider? Arachnophobia. <laughs> Has anyone seen that movie, Arachnophobia? Yeah, that's pretty freaky, eh, that movie? Anyway. And uh, so we have a phobia. Why do we have phobias? It's exactly the same reason. It's got nothing to do with the spider, the height, the closed space, nothing. It's got everything to do with the withdrawal of love from one or both of our parents who were in that situation at the time with us. So, for example, you go along, a little child, two years of age, you go along, you pick up a redback spider and you're looking at it, and for overseas people, a redback spider is like a black widow but with a red back on the back of it and you look at it and it can bite you and it can cause you death but the child's not thinking about it that's just looking at the spider I actually did this when I was a child I can remember doing it my mother came out brushed the spider off me in a panic and rage and in that moment no love so where, what did you think I associated spiders with spiders no love from mum spiders no love from mum spiders total fear of spiders and what is it you're afraid of really no love from mum I can't feel that there's no love from mum and it's the same with uh, falling from a height you know fear of heights fear of closed in spaces fear of anything They're all related to to things related to our parents and their emotions about those things that caused us to feel a lack of love at the time. So can you see how the cause, finding the cause, often has nothing to do with the effect in a, in a seemingly logical manner. So for most of us, we look at how many of you are afraid of spiders? How many of you are afraid of snakes, spiders, lizards, frogs, mice? Put them all together, how many of you are afraid? Okay, so 90% so of the audience. All of those things have nothing to do with the animal. 
and you can test this if you want, you can put the animal in your hand and feel your terror, <laughs> and next week you're going to have just as much terror as you had the first time you put the animal in your hand. Until you make the link that it's about the withdrawal of love, you will not address the phobia. Does that make sense? Because it's only when we address the cause that the phobia disappears. It's always the cause. It's never the effect. And many of us can try to deal with it. So how many of you are afraid of heights, falling from a height, dropping, free-falling from a height, <laughs> and all of those kind of things? Right? So probably 50% of the audience. That has something to do with something that happened to you as a child related to the withdrawal of love and you falling. So you might have been in your mum's arms. Or you might have been this. You know, daddy's throwing you up, catching you, throwing you up, catching you, and you're laughing and carrying on and everything's funny. And then mum comes in the room and says, What are you doing? What are you doing? It could be that event that causes you to be afraid of that feeling. And so now every time you're driving along the road and you go over a little bump, ooh, that's a feeling, the same feeling. Yeah? And you're not ever going to get rid of that feeling until you link the cause, which is my mother's withdrawal of love of a fear projected at daddy throwing me up in the air and catching me. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? Yeah? Logical? Logical? Yeah? Igor? How can... How can we uh, make a link if we, if we don't remember? Well, it's very hard to make the link, but, uh, but if, this is why we're having this discussion, is to understand, and, and this is why I brought this, this situation up, is to understand that most causes are to do with love, not to do with other things. So they're to do with love or a lack of it. Them. So anything that is loving causes a loving and joyful effect. Anything that is unloving causes an unloving effect. So if I've got a fear of money or I don't have enough money in my life, for example, it's got to be related to love somehow. And the key is for you to just, you know, allow yourself, pardon me, allow yourself to, to have the awareness at your soul level that it has to be related to love somehow. Instead of trying to guess that it's related to something else other than love. Does everyone follow that? Like, you know, what a, a lot of times what we're trying to do is we're trying to guess that it's, oh, it must be this and that happened and this event happened or whatever. But we're not relating a lot of our stuff to love. And it's the love that needs to grow in us. And it's the love that needs to change. And love and fear cannot coexist at the same time. And so therefore, many of the unloving effects are caused by fear-based, lack of love causes. And, and there is a linkage between love and the lack of love and our fear. When you get down to it, you'll find that all of your fear is related to love. All of it. A feeling that you're not loved, a feeling that you cannot be loved, a feeling that you're unlovable, a feeling that you're unworthy to be loved, a feeling, all of your fear is related to that at some point. And the reason why is because every single time your parents were in fear or in anger, which is the denial of their fear, you did not feel loved. And yes, we do need to process the emotions we need to process, but in the end you will come to see the relationship. And, and it took me a while, to be honest, Igor, to, to actually stop trying to... Um, work out events and situations and so forth and to start seeing the, that God was just correcting love within me. And, and this, is, this is what the law of cause and effect helped me to understand was that God is actually correcting the love or the, or the type of love or the lack of love within me. And that was the cause of all of these unloving effects, these painful things that were happening in my life. And as long as I was willing to feel those unloving causes, like to feel the feelings associated with them, I could release them and come to understand love in the process. Mm. Joy, please. Um, 
Is that why I heard a comment that you said that if you were conceived during the war, then you're conceived out of fear. And so the fear means that there's, there's no love during that conception, like... No, I don't, I don't think I've ever said that. I've said that if you were conceived during the war and your parents were in fear at the time, then obviously there was no love present um, in your life from that time. And it would be associated with potential acts of violence. So you would actually have a terrible phobia about any violent act. You won't want to watch it on telly, probably, or you'll do exactly the opposite. You'll get video after video after video violent, wanting to watch the movies of violent videos and violent... Do you know what I mean? You'll do one or the other, generally. And a lot of our emotions are... There is always a love component in our emotions, in other words, or, or a lack of love component in our emotions. And and we need, to, we need to see the relationship between the love components and what's going on in the effect of the emotion. And so, like, for many of you, how many of you were born during the war years, the Second World War years? Is there many of you? One, two, three, four, five, around five or so. Um, how many of you had parents who experienced the Second World War? And where do your emotions come from? Your primary environment is your parents, is it not? So, so can you see that for many of us, there are going to be fear emotions about the lack of love when it comes to situations that are violent or potentially violent, a threat of war, a threat of potential violence, anarchy and so forth. Those emotions are going to be within us because a lot of us or our parents, uh, for a lot of them, they did not release those emotions. Yeah. For me, with regard to war, it was my grandparents. So, um, my my father was born just after my uh, my grandfather came home from war, and my mother was born after that. So, um, both of my grandfathers went to war. So, um, for me, I'm a third generation from uh, you know three generations from a war. But many of you are only two or one generation from a war which means you're going to have more emotions associated with that potential violence. Yep. Um, hi, AJ. How are you? Um, I'm not feeling very good. <laughs> um, I'm adopted. Yep. And um, having two sets of parents... Do I, you know both of them now? I do. You do, yeah. yep. Um, yep. Yes. <laughs> um, and they're so... Uh, Different? Yeah, yep. yeah, like my biological dad rides a Harley. Yeah. So I've got a Harley, but yep. my dad that I grew up with is so scared about me riding my Harley <laughs> that I didn't tell him about it for yep. years and years and years and then, you know, stepping in truth. Anyway, that's yep. it's a story, but yep. um, I get really confused in where it came from. My causes. Yeah. Um, you don't need to worry where a causal came from. Which parent? No, you don't need to worry about which parent it came from. Your body will tell you anyway. Left side has to be feminine, right side has to be masculine. So whatever happens to my left side has to be related to myself if I'm a woman. My, whatever happens to my left side has to be related to myself or my mother or my dad's viewpoint of my mother. And whatever happened to my right side has to be related to my father or uh, men or my, da my mother's viewpoint of men. It's quite simple. There's body is going to tell me all of that. Um, so, so I don't need to have to worry about all of that anyway. All I need to do is feel it. Feel the one that's there. That, that's the trick. You see, for most of us, what we're trying to do still is work it out before we feel it. And why do we do that? Because we're afraid. Why are we afraid? Because we want to control the emotion so that we don't go overboard with the emotion and go into crazy. Does that make sense? But in terms of giving you a bit more of a, 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 an issue about the issue of adoption, the biological mother and father will have had a per, uh, their child for a certain period of time. It might be one week from gestation oh, to one week. Given away at birth. Given away at birth. Yep. So it's still gestation through to birth. Yeah. So there's still the, the first basically nine months where you would have absorbed the emotions of mum and that mum and dad. Does that make sense? And then if you're given away at birth, then you start absorbing the emotions of this mum and dad. 
the, the adoptive parents. Do I still absorb um, knowing my biological parents, mm -hmm. like um, have done for a little while, am I still absorbing their emotions? Or well, not really. What happens is during, like during this nine-month period, you absorb a c and have a connection with them and you absorb a lot of their predisposed emotions. Does that make sense? Which automatically makes you open to understanding them and open to feeling their type of emotion automatically. So when you reconnect with them later in your life, you will automatically feel certain things as a result of your openness to feeling things from them already. That's already been established. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And your period of time with this group of family will actually predispose you to actually accepting emotions from that type of parents, whoever they are. But in the end, the underlying result is that we still need to feel our causal emotions and we just need to release them and allow ourselves to get to them. And a lot of times we want to know because we don't want to feel. It's my brain wanting to know which parent it is or something. Mm. Yep. Can I just write that down? It's something that would benefit many of you. After, if I can get the rest of this off, I'll write it down. That's the fast way of getting it off. I want to know intellectually before I feel, then I don't want to feel emotionally. The same thing, so referring to one thing. So some things you'll find in your life you'll want to feel emotionally and you'll relatively easily feel them, to be honest. Other things, you'll have this going on, where you want to know intellectually before you go ahead and do it. You want to know what's going on before you feel it. I suggest to you, if you want to know what's going on before you feel it, you don't really want to know what's going on and you don't want to feel what's going on. So what I would do myself under those circumstances is I pray about my will, my desire to know, my desire to know from my heart, from my soul. That's what I pray about. I have obviously need to work on my desire to know. So there's many things that I've had to work on my desire to know, to, to actually have a desire or a will to feel it rather than just know it intellectually. And many of you have learned by now that actually knowing something intellectually hardly helps you at all <laughs> in many cases. And in fact, unfortunately, oftentimes puts you in a state of self-delusion because you think you've dealt with something that you haven't even touched yet when you know it. So, so whenever you want to know something in advance, just stop yourself and go, OK, this is all about me not being willing to feel out of control, to feel that I don't know, to feel that I'm um, crazy or, or stupid or, you know, lots of those kind of emotions. That's what it's mostly about. Does that make sense? Who was I answering? Sorry. Glennis, that's right. Does that make sense, Glennis? Yeah. 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 So that's allow fear. yourself to address that. The issues with regard to parents are complex, um, but, but in a way it's, it's, it's still the same. You know, it's the willingness to feel the emotion that's going to get you through everything anyway. Yeah, they're pretty intense. I'm trying to deal with the time about you've been given away. So. Yeah. You know when you say it's pretty intense? And my suggestion to you, uh, many of you say these things to me, oh, I went through this really intense experience the other day, and you explain it. And 
you need to have intense feelings. Your, your soul in its, in its greatest power is intense. Like, that's where all your power is, in the intensity of things. You see, when we avoid intensity, we're actually avoiding our soul. We need to allow the intensity to be present. And when you do that, you won't actually need to describe an emotion as intense to other people. You won't need to do that because you, you actually fully embrace the intensity. Every emotion I've ever felt has been intense. And when I say intense, like we're talking about some things I've cried for six months straight, literally, you know, like all day for six months some things. Yeah. Grief of losing my soulmate, for example, was one of those things. Now that's intense. And during that time, yes, there were times when I felt crazy, I felt, you know, all those different things, like I was losing my mind, I felt, and I just allowed myself to feel all of those feelings. And nobody else actually knew that I went through it. The only time I stopped crying was when I was shopping <laughs> and when I slept. I'm not that intense. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. You don't have to worry about that because what, when you fully connect with an emotion, every emotion will feel intense. It will feel intense. And you need to allow your soul... Remember I gave that talk about stretching your soul, allowing your soul to expand? Intensity, you need to allow yourself to experience your emotions in an intense manner. You know how parents always go, oh, you're far too sensitive. You know, you're far too sensitive. That's even crap. You know, you want a sensitive soul. You want to be sensitive. You want to feel things intensely. Because eventually you'll get to the point where you've released all your pain and the only thing you'll feel intensely is your pleasure. <laughs> yeah, you imagine that. that. That's that one with God. Imagine that, that the only thing you feel is your pleasure and you feel it intensely. If you, you have to get used to intensity. Um, Karen, thanks. When you cry for such a long time about something, how do you know that it's um, not a, a self-deception emotion? Well, the law of attraction. Remember, cause and effect always tells you. So if you find things changing over that time, then you know... If external events are changing over that time, then you know that things are changing for you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. It just seemed like six months was a long time. To well, it was. Yeah, yeah. But you don't have no idea how attached I was to my soulmate either. Okay. Because you've never been there, and one day you will know and understand. But, but you know, and, and so you can't really judge it. You're not going to ever feel it. And you don't need to worry about it. I'm just explaining to you that I use it as an example to, to say to you, allow the intensity. You know, allow it. Because if you allow it, your soul expands. That's the principle I'm getting at. You won't ever have to experience that with your soul, mate. Uh, it's highly unlikely many of you will want to come back to this earth. And by the time you want to come back to this earth, if you do want to come back to the earth, it's highly likely that the earth will have changed quite significantly. And there might even be some people who are at one with God who you can incarnate through and not have to deal with any emotions. That's the reality, right? So, so if you wanted to come back to the earth, you, no matter what happens from now on, you will never have to experience the pain of my soulmate loss, ever, in your own life. right? But I am saying to you that every single emotion that you actually have to feel, you will feel stretches you intensely. And you need to allow it. You need to let it happen. That's the key to growth. Yeah. Um, Natalie? Just on, on that with your law of attraction changing, you, we were talking before about um, parents and, and sometimes their behaviour doesn't change, but the feeling inside myself towards them about their behaviour changes, is yeah. that considered...? Well, remember I said in the description of the, law, of the law of cause and effect and the law of attraction is that if you no longer feel pain from the event then obviously something's changed for yeah. you. Yeah. Is remember, remember I drew the painful emotion They're down here? So an event is created, causes a painful emotion. Now, firstly, what I would do is I'd say, if the event is created, then 
there still might be something present inside of your soul. Whether you feel pain or not, you could be totally detuned from your pain. Does that make sense? Yep. So you need to look at that. Okay. Because um, usually when you deal with a causal emotion within your soul, the event is no longer created. Okay. And if it is created, you understand who created it. And, and you, if it's a painful event for other people and you're at one with God, you know that you didn't create it. So, just hypothetically, if I was at one with God, my mum wouldn't be the way she is with me. No, she couldn't be the way she... When I say she's, she couldn't be the way she is with you, no. She might want to murder you. Okay. <laughs> do you understand? I don't have to be at one with God for that. No, she already wants that. But, but do you understand? Because, but, because that it might be other things creating her desire to do that, other than your soul. All we can deal with is what's in our own soul with regard to the creation event. And remember I said to you that you are not responsible for everything that gets created. Yeah. Right? However, most of us think we're not responsible for anything that gets created, and that's totally untrue. <laughs> and in fact, in, our, in an unhealed condition, we are responsible for most of what gets created. That is also true. But once we become at one with God, we're not responsible for, when I say we're not responsible, we're not responsible for any negative, painful event that's caused for somebody else because we no longer feel pain and we cannot create an unloving, painful event. We can actually, though, say something or do something in truth that creates an event that others perceive to be unloving. So you know how most of you perceive my death in the first century to be unloving. Well, I didn't see it as that. Okay. Mm. Thank you. But others did, of course. All the disciples all were gutted by the event. They, they still call it in the spirit world the great loss. Still now. That's how they refer to it. Right? So, so they had huge amounts of grief associated with the event. My soulmate included. Yeah. But I did not. So... Who created the event? <laughs> Good question, isn't it? Tara, thanks. It's time to go home, don't you think? Yeah. Go on, Tara. One more question. I don't even know how to ask this, but um, I know that I, I'm being more aware of the causes I'm creating in our children. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I'm going through a lot of repentance about n not f actually feeling love for them a lot of the time, mm -hmm. especially the boys. Mm -hmm. Can I point out to you that the feeling of realisation that you do not fi that you do did not feel love for them or do not at times feel love for them, that I'd call that a realisation. As, as in an intellectual one? Yes, it's not repentance. Because repentance gets... If you, if you really repent from it, you have to see the causes to why you don't love them. That's where I'm stuck. And you have to feel that. You have to feel that cause to be truly repentant. So it's one thing to have the intellectual acknowledgement and the feeling-based acknowledgement of, yes, I, I can see that I don't love them. And I can see that in this moment, I actually don't feel any love for them. I actually feel angry with them or upset with them or whatever it is that you feel. That that is important part of the process. So you, you don't want to turn that off. Mm. But what you need to do is allow yourself to get to find the reason why you don't love them. Mm. And the reason why you don't love your sons in particular, right? Isn't it mostly the sons, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Is related obviously to men. Mm. And something that happened to you as a child related to men. Yeah. That you're unwilling to feel. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I, d I don't know anything, but that's right. I, I agree. Yep. And the reason why you don't know at this stage is because you're unwilling to feel that. You're certainly willing to have the realisation and willing to feel that you don't love them, but you're not yet willing to feel the real feeling of something happened to me in my childhood that causes me to feel that I can't love men. So at the moment, just allowing myself to, to keep feeling the sadness of... Because I really feel so sad about the fact that I can't fully 
love them unconditionally. So I just keep uh, feeling that and eventually I can. Yeah, see, I don't feel that's truthful. The okay. reality is you don't want to love them. Yeah. And that's caused by an emotion in you coming from your childhood in relation to men. Yep. I would, if I was you, go into the feeling, I don't want to love men. Yep. I don't want to love them. Okay. And let yourself feel the anger of that position. I don't want to love them. And then you'll get into the why you don't want to love them. Yeah. That makes sense? And that will lead you to the emotion, the causal emotion, the cause, rather than just looking at the effect. The effect is you don't love them. Okay. And they feel the effect of that most days and they totally. rebel against that. And some of them conform, but the others rebel against that. And, and you feel the effect of that every single day. My suggestion is now to go into the feeling you have that I don't want to love them. Mm. And that will be, re instead of judging it, so you've been judging it a long time now, stop judging the emotion that you don't want to love your children, and in particular your sons, and start feeling why you don't want to love them. What is it about men that causes you to not want to love them? Because this is what confuses me. I can feel so much love for Liam, and I feel like my love is... I I'm sorry, I can't agree. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't agree with that statement. Um, you believe it's love that you're feeling for Liam because Liam does a lot of things that please you. Yeah. If Liam stopped doing things that pleased you, how would you then feel? Well, I, we've already um, been seeing these addictions and yep. addressing them. Yes. So. And, and what I'm suggesting to you is your children are doing less to please you, and this is the reason why you're finding them difficult to love. But the reason why they're doing less to please you is because they feel unloved. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Whereas Liam has got his own emotional issues with his own mother that he's carried into the relationship and so therefore does pander to the woman. Therefore, you do feel loved when you're with Liam and so then you feel happier and you feel like you love him. Yeah. But it's not true love yet because true love loves a person no matter what the person does or how they treat you. Yeah. It's immaterial how they treat you. Okay. They can hate you or love you, you will still love them. They can want to leave you. Liam can want to run off with another woman. And if you really loved him, you would still love him. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, but it's hard to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it hard is very to hard to hear. <laughs> Thank you. And, and this is where the children are great because they show you mm -hmm. that the injury exists. Whereas Liam can't show you because he's, he has the same injury favouring the woman that you have. And so he can't show you that the injury resists. He is attracted to you because the injury exists. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Uh, whereas your children are not attracted to you because the injury resists. Uh, they are feeling the effects of the injury and they are responding in their manners that they do based on their personalities to that injury. Yeah. So they are far more trustworthy <laughs> reflections of what's really going on inside of you towards men. And in fact, in both of you towards men, not just one of you towards men. Because okay. at the moment in your family, there's a definite favouring of the woman. And since there's a definite favouring of the woman, the men, the little children who are men in the family feel unloved. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yep. And they're responding to this unloved feeling. Oh, yeah. Some of them in rebellion, <laughs> causing havoc, <laughs> and others quiet reading a book trying to stay away from everything yeah true yeah yes. different personality causes a different response yeah yeah i said that was the last question josh sorry about that we we do need to finish it's four o'clock and i was meant to finish at three o'clock so um i hope you've uh, managed to understand a bit more of the law of cause and effect yeah has that been helpful yeah that's good and, uh, and hopefully it will help you identify issues because remember that primary, that primary thing that whenever there is love in the cause, there will be a loving, joyful effect. Whenever there is unloving cause, there is an unloving, unhappy, painful effect. So the key is we can work backwards. We can go, well, is this painful to me? Yes, it's painful. There must be something about love that I'm not getting here. And if it's pleasurable to you, you go, oh, it's pleasurable to me. Okay, interesting. I think I'll leave that and just enjoy it. <laughs> Until such a time as I'm shown otherwise. Um,
I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks if you want to come along. I think it's on the 18th, is that right, Joy? We've, allowed, we've cancelled the 17th yes, and, the we've ju- and we've just made it Sunday the 18th, yep. And uh, it will be probably our last talk before we go away uh, overseas. So it will be probably our last talk here until uh, March sometime. Um, so that, that'll be next week on the, uh, or two weeks' time on the 18th. Myself and Mary are, are taking off down to uh, New South Wales this week and we'll be just uh, catching up with the guys at, at Kentucky near Armidale uh, just for, I think we've got a Wednesday evening book there where we're going to have a session there and that'll be the last of the sessions we'll have until we see you on our fun day on the 7th and 8th, hopefully with some of you singing to me. <laughs> or, or, or uh, acting or dr- dramatising something or enjoying yourself at least. And, uh, and we hope that you practice for that. You've got holiday time. Are you all busy holiday time? Or are you less busy? Most of you feel less busy. How many of you uh, doing the Christmas thing? Lots of you doing the Christmas thing? Yeah, not many of you. <laughs> What's going on? Hey, so I don't know when I died. You don't want to celebrate my death. My death was pointless. Um, <laughs> celebrate your own birth, that's fine. <laughs> you don't need to celebrate mine. Um, yeah, just, just uh, I feel it's a great opportunity to have some fun over the coming break. Yeah, for most people, they're a bit more relaxed and, and as a result, a bit more joyful and so forth, particularly once they get over Christmas Day. <laughs> um, so we look forward to seeing you perhaps uh, informally over the next uh, few weeks or so. And if we don't see you on, this, on the 18th, then please have a safe period over the, over the holiday period and enjoy yourself. And we look forward to seeing you sometime in, our, in the next new year. We feel it's going to be a very interesting year. So, so to, to put it mildly. And uh, so, so we're looking forward to the year and seeing what we can accomplish as a group together with regard to growing in love in particular. And so we uh, um, would like to encourage you to use this very busy and sometimes stressful time over the next few months to really practice love and identify the causal reasons inside of you as to why you find practicing love difficult. Does that make sense? So have a good time and thanks for your time today. And thank you. And we'll see you in a few weeks' time, maybe. Yep. G'day. Yeah.